him when he gets here. Um, okay, um, welcome to the October 14th, 2020 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we have the roll call, please, Matt? Yes, Madam Chairman. Councillor Valerie Devereaux. Here. Councillor Jeremy Gabrielson. Here. Councillor Jamie Garvin. Here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Here. Councillor Penny Jordan. Here. And Chairman Valerie Adams. Here. Okay, uh, we shall rise now for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Okay. Thank you. And hi, Chris. Welcome. Um, well, I had to find the participant link in my email. I, I had the same issue. <laughs> um, okay. So before we get started with the rest of the agenda, we have a special occasion this evening, the presentation of the Ralph T. Gould Award. Now I have to reorganize my screen. Okay, um, so I am pleased to have the honor on behalf of the council this evening of delivering the Ralph T. Gould Award. When this evening's recipient was nominated, um, town manager Matt Sturgis commented that this individual meets and exceeds the definition of this award as a friend as an, and as an employee. Robert Malley, Bob to most everyone, has been described as the epitome of a public servant. In his 40 plus years of service to the town, beginning with his position as a clerk in 1979 and quickly rising through the ranks to become director of public works at just 28 years old, Bob has proven himself time and again to be a truly dedicated public servant. Not only has he spearheaded major projects throughout the years, but he has been as willing to manage a significant sewer separation undertaking as he has been to jump behind the wheel of a plow truck in the dead of winter to ensure that our roads are clear and safe. Among Bob's countless accomplishments are the construction of the public works facility and the upgrade of the recycling center. He has also managed three year Scott Dyer Road project revamping the town's east west corridor and he has a long term legacy with Fort Williams Park. I could go on and on about what Bob has accomplished in his decades of service to this town, but we would be here all night. Bob's dedication is unmatched and in honor of his outstanding service to the town of Cape Elizabeth, it is with pleasure that I present him with the Ralph T. Gould Award, which as I understand his wife is hiding for him and will now present to him. We'll have to wait for technology to catch up with us. <laughs> but Becky should be popping up here in a moment. You just have to uh, uh, turn on your video and uh, unmute your audio, Becky, to, to join us, if you can hear me. I know, Bob, it's a dirty trick. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, uh, you kind of misled me a little bit, Matt. I had to tell one little white lie today, and it was to you, my friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. You recognize this lady uh, on the screen? Uh, I can't see her. Well, uh, in the in the age of COVID, uh, we had to use some, uh, I guess you could call it treachery to uh, to present uh, the award. And so, Madam Chairman, if you'd like to uh, present the award via Mrs. Malley to Mr. Malley. Yes, there is the, the award. And um, if you could go ahead and present it on our behalf to Bob, that would be very much appreciated by the council. So we are physical distancing. Uh, I'm about three hours away from Becky <laughs> up in Jackman. Uh -huh. <laughs> Not showing any symptoms, but uh, I've been up here in Jackman since uh, late Saturday and coming home tomorrow. Well, you can receive the award upon your return. Well, thank you. And I just, you know, on behalf of uh, 
you know, my service to the town. I really want to thank uh, the council for uh, this recognition. I knew or know of many of the recipients of previous recipients of the award. So uh, it's an honor to be in their company and uh, very proud of my service for the community and, and proud of what public works does in the community. I, you know, I've gone on the record of uh, projects and endeavors that I've been pleased and been uh, proud to be a part of, but I, I'm really proud of what our public works department does in Cape Elizabeth. And we do more than just plow snow and sweep streets. We do so many things uh, with so many different, uh, uh, you know, things under our umbrella and our staff, you know, pulls that all off. So I'm proud of what we do for the town and proud to have been a part of that for so long. And uh, you've really taken me by surprise here. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, recognition. It means a, a tremendous amount to me. Thank you, Bob. And congratulations. Thank you. You get back to your relaxation up in Jackman. We don't want to keep you here for now that you're retired. No, that's fine. Not a problem. Uh, again, thank you again. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Have a, have a great night. All right. Thank you. Okay. Got the era of COVID. <laughs> um, okay. COVID blindside right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so the next item we'll be moving on to. Does anyone have any reports or correspondence this evening? I do have something, but I'll let uh, Penny and Valerie at the same time. So and we'll go alphabetically. Uh, Penny, why don't, I, or Valerie, why don't you go first? Okay. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that the Civil Rights Committee met uh, two weeks ago. There's this next meeting will be tomorrow night. So they've uh, all met each other, they're gearing up and ready to start looking at uh, different policy manuals in town. And um, please join the meeting if you want to join tomorrow night. Is that at seven o'clock tomorrow? Seven o'clock. Yes. <laughs> seven o'clock tomorrow night. Um, Penny? Okay, I have uh, a couple of things. And uh, the first one has to do with short term rentals. Um, and um, I've been following the work that the planning board has been doing around short term rentals and uh, people in town will see it on their agenda for uh, their upcoming um, planning board meeting on the 20th, but the intent of that um, is that they really set the uh, public hearing where uh, this is the forum on the 17th of November. Everybody mark their calendars uh, who would like to participate in that public hearing for uh, short term rentals. This is an important part of the process as the planning board works through the um, proposed changes to short-term rentals and will come up with their recommendations on how uh, what the council ordinance committee came up with. Um, uh, they'll recommend uh, potential alterations and it'll eventually be sent back to the council. But I just want people to stay engaged in this short-term rental process because it's so um, it's so important and we've all put uh, so much work into it. Um, the other thing I have is, it's probably a question for Matt, and Matt, I don't know if uh, you're going to be talking about this as part of your report, but um, I really would like to have conversation about uh, the hours of uh, early voting and where we're at from a volume perspective, because um, this is a... Uh, a high energy topic with uh, many people in town. So I don't know, are you going to do that as part of your update or do we want to talk about it now? If I may through the chair. Uh, yeah, if I, I could just, um, so Matt and I had already actually discussed that and that's what I plan to bring up as well. So cool. um, do you, Matt, do you want to just pick up or should I? 
I have, a, if I may, I have a, a pretty extensive manager's report specifically to the subject. And, and then if you want, it may be productive to bring that information out. And then uh, I'm obviously always open to questions after, after that as well, if that would be helpful to the council. Okay, yeah. So I'll just note that um, we did, I received a significant amount of correspondence about this issue. I'm sure others did as well. Um, Matt and I discussed it. Matt then discussed it with um, Deb, our clerk, to see what possibly they could do. So he, he will have some updates about expanding the hours. Um, and I'm sure you'll have all those numbers that we talked about in the report as well. Yes, so I, I don't need to go into that. But um, the short answer is yes, we will be expanding the hours and we'll let Matt address that fully in a moment. I had one more thing, and this is probably just a um, a question uh, around. It's been um, chatter, uh, conversation around library opening and stuff like that. I don't know where we're at on that, um, but I know that people have been sending questions regarding um, library and access to uh, the library. So I don't know if at some point in time we can have an update around that. Do you have an update in your report, Matt? Uh, I do not on that, but I'd be happy to uh, uh, talk about that as well. It's it's a very active discussion with uh, myself as well as uh, with uh, Rachel Davis, the TML director, uh, as far as how we can uh, kind of go into the next phase of, of opening. And I know she's working on a plan uh, that we'd like to be launching uh, fairly soon. Uh, right now, you know, we've been doing a square footage analysis to see the number of patrons who we could allow. And if we do go to that version, uh, we are in the process uh, uh, about to advertise for, uh, we have two vacancies. Uh, we had two gentlemen that left our employee over the course of the summer. Uh, so uh, we're looking to fill those positions and then I think we can meet the, the challenge uh, in a better way. But uh, Rachel is currently working on an active plan to uh, come back and allow us the uh, opportunity to have folks into the library actively. Uh, she, there was a very live discussion item with the uh, TML board of directors or the uh, TML committee uh, at their most recent meeting as well. Cause uh, you know, we did, we had received a couple of other emails earlier and you know, I said, you know, like, I think it'd be great if they, if she could work with the TML committee to see what their thoughts were. Uh, that also resulted in a, uh, in a survey that was sent out or, or to a number of patrons and they, they received back 310 responses on that. The majority of them overwhelmingly were supportive of the current operations that we do have, but uh, obviously we can't, we know we can't stay in a holding pattern for forever. That just doesn't, doesn't do it for, for us or for the patrons. So um, we will be, you know, looking at installing a higher level of PPE uh, to do that as well. Uh, but we do have a plan and, uh, or it's in fabrication mode right now, but, uh, I'll be able to report on that, I think, uh, towards the, hopefully towards the end of the month as to what we're looking at for a launch. The challenge is uh, obviously the numbers of, of virus exposure has been starting to trend in the, in the wrong direction lately, which is somewhat concerning. And I'd hate to see, you know, if we open up for a week, then all of a sudden we get exposed and something happens and we close the operation down, which, you know, that's unfortunately, that's, that's the reality we all live with uh, in uh, where we work and different organizations. but. Uh, with a public facility, uh, we have somewhat different rules. They have not changed since the summer from the governor's executive order. Uh, but we are looking right now at, at possibly about a dozen people would be able to come in at a time for, for half hour windows would probably be the way that we'd be when we do end up launching. I think we'll be looking at that type of, uh, that type of uh, opening to, to begin, uh, you know, without computer access, things along those lines. But uh, it's a challenge, but it is something that we are, are trying to have a plan ready to go because as I said, we can't stay in a holding pattern for forever. Although, you know, the, the online uh, and the curbside has been doing huge numbers. That a, a result of the survey uh, were some changes in how they delivered that, uh, those options to people, expanded the uh, ability to, to have folks come in a little less rigid than before where people had, a, had to set an appointment and come in uh, to uh, pick up and uh, with a very tight window and now they've expanded that. Uh, and, and one thing that's been great, uh, if you can find bright spots uh, in this environment, is uh, the programming has been tremendous. They are getting huge numbers of people and they, 
people have embraced the programming. So that's been a, a really a bright light in all of this is that we've actually probably increased our outreach to many who in, a, in, the, in the past may not have had the opportunity to come to the library programming. So uh, that's been a bright spot in this. And I think one that will continue uh, going forward with as we go, you know, as we go into the future. And then we're also looking at a reorganization of uh, the, the staffing model over there that Rachel is working on and she's got that close to finished uh, because there's been a, uh, a reliance in the past on substitutes and uh, part-timers and things along those lines. And, uh, you know, we've had discussions over the course of the summer saying, if you have the opportunity to reorganize and come back better and stronger with, than, than where you were before, wouldn't you embrace that opportunity? So, you know, like we did at the pool and the fitness center, things along those lines, the library has presented us some opportunities. So I think we'll have some good changes that will come from this. Uh, and I think, you know, we've got a heck of a library director. Rachel does a great job and uh, she's very thoughtful and really uh, is trying to come up with the most thoughtful plan forward. So um, we will have an update uh, soon on how we can do the relaunch. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Okay. Any other reports and correspondence? Um, and on the on the election issue, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to Debbie and her staff, who I understand have been just stretched absolutely thin. And in fact, Debbie is not with us this evening because she is working on processing ballots. So huge thank you to Debbie please convey that. I know I've said it earlier, Matt, but I can't say it enough. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's not many towns that can say they have a town clerk who has actively worked uh, eight presidential elections. And uh, that's, you know, I will say the assistant town manager, town clerk knows her business probably better than any. And uh, she, she's a hero in, in my book. So, but yeah, she's still here, but she's working on elections <laughs> material. So thank you for that. I'll make sure she hears that as well. Thank you, Chairman. Um, okay, so finance committee report. I'll turn it over to you, Jamie. Thank you, Valerie. Um, so uh, just brief update. Uh, everybody received the dashboard um, uh, for this month. Um, nothing terribly remarkable to point out. Um, as Matt noted in his cover note to us, um, you know, pacing uh, ahead of schedule and ahead of uh, forecast as it relates to building permits and excise taxes, which uh, thankfully I, th I think shows, you know, continued um, either strength and or um, lack of negative impact, um, at least within Cape Elizabeth for um, uh, uh, from an economic standpoint uh, for most residents. Um, Matt, I did have a question um, that I meant to bring up to you previously. I know you know where we're pacing on the headlight gift shop sales which is all to be expected and your your explanation corresponds with that but did we not reduce the budget year number for this year to be lower than last i thought we had i thought i, I thought we had as well um i'll have to double check that and i know we, okay we, uh, we'll also see a, a on the you know it sounds funny to say it like this but as we see a reduction on the revenues we're also going to see a reduction on the expenditures because of course yep. if we're not going to be selling we don't need to be buying as much material so we'll see you know that'll that'll balance out yeah i just thought uh, reflecting as a percentage of pacing to forecast i think i think that that number is off because I, I i was pretty sure that we pulled down that budget forecast um for, for on the revenue side at least so um so the only other thing I would bring up on the finance report is um, we are uh, expecting completion of the audit uh, in the relative near future. I don't know if a date's been committed to yet by RKO yet, Matt. Uh, got that should, commitment from them? We have not received that from them yet, but I anticipate we will be hearing from them by the end of the month. So uh, I, you know, I, I hope to hear from them and get them to report out in, in November, uh, yeah. early December at the latest. So just a reminder to folks that um, when we do receive that report, we, we schedule a joint meeting with the school board um, to receive and review um, their presentation of the, of the audit um, uh, for the past fiscal year. And then um, there was one other thing I was going to mention, totally, totally spaced on it. I forget. I'm sorry. So that's it. Oh, I remember what it was. Um, the um, uh, uh, joint uh, 
Joint Finance Committee, uh, uh, subcommittee uh, rather of, of the uh, chairs of the school board and finance chairs of the school board and town council are scheduled to meet on the 22nd of October at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Um, so that'll be posted and noticed uh, if it hasn't yep. been already. That's, that's what I was gonna note as well. Uh, yep. Sorry, I don't have a raised yeah. hand function. Go ahead, Penny. What about the um, the cable franchise uh, that uh, audit that was done? Is that represented in here at all, or where is that standing? If if I may uh, on that, we uh, that was that was a nice that was a nice story. I, I guess I would say that uh, it's always better to find out that we're anticipating more revenue than than we had received. Uh, we shall probably, you know, I know right now, uh, Charter slash Spectrum slash Time Warner uh, is reviewing the information. Uh, I will say they've been fairly quiet about it, but I understand that they're reviewing the information that has been provided, and then we'll be responding on that. Uh, that's, it's it's an interesting story when it comes to that. Uh, it was something that uh, GP Cog had offered as a service, and with us coming up uh, with an extension or with the renegotiation in 2023 felt it was an appropriate time to a have our our our, uh, our uh, franchise agreement reviewed by uh, by by someone who actually does that for a living and uh, uh, Bradley law was chosen as the firm they've done a beautiful job obviously when they come out and say that we you know through the and then they offered the audit services and uh, to which I uh, I signed us up for that as well with a number of other towns because we're all in a similar boat uh, the one thing we all as managers and uh, as well as electeds and other towns uh, have in common is that uh, we don't negotiate uh, franchise agreements with cable companies on a daily basis. So uh, felt it was good to have someone uh, review that and it, and it has paid off. So uh, we will anticipate hearing more from them uh, over the next, I would figure the next month uh, to six weeks at the most after they get done reviewing it. Uh, but I, it will reflect that in the spring, you know, if, if and when they do pay it, I, I, I think that'll come. So you'll, you may see a bump at one point and then the normal amount that we receive in the spring uh, when they normally pay us as well, which is in, you know, looking at it, we've, we've run about $150,000 annually. And so there wasn't really any red flag saying, you know, except for the one year that they were short and I called them and they responded and, and provided more income. And that was two years ago. So, uh, but uh, I think, you know, Stand by for future updates, I guess, is, is the long-winded way of saying that. But we should see that revenue this year. Okay, great. And if, I, if I may ask, uh, add one last item. Uh, on the uh, sewer fund receipts, the way that they, they posted, it looks like we're uh, a low on that at 201. Uh, but we posted those again on October 8th. We're actually at 400 and, uh, almost $440,000 now for uh, sewer receipts. So. Uh, I received the an update from uh, from John Q uh, when it comes to uh, those revenues. So that that picture got a lot brighter with that update after those numbers were posted after the start of the month. Any other questions about the finance report? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matt and Jamie. Um, Okay, so the next item on our agenda is citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Um, we did bring up the voting issue, but I understand there may be individuals who want to speak about that. And just to clarify, that is not an item on the agenda this evening. So if you wish to speak about it, this would be your opportunity, um, along with anything else not on the agenda. Um, please do try to keep your comments to about three minutes per person. And please identify yourself by name and address or local affiliation if that is relevant. And uh, you've used the raise hand feature. I see a number of hands going up. So I will recognize you and then Matt will um, give you permission to speak, but you will have to unmute yourself prior to actually being able to speak. Um, Jim. You're good to go, Jim. Thank you. This is Jim Mora, 5 Wombeck Road. I am disappointed with the town council workshop last week. The meeting started with the majority of the town council in favor of accepting oceanfront paper streets and ended with accepting these paper streets not on tonight's agenda. What happened? 
One town council member wanted to ask plaintiffs from the last lawsuit if they will now work with the town. I interpret this not as a helpful suggestion, but as a political move to delay. Another town council member wants a plan to accept. The plan of the majority of the town council members was clear to me. Accept the oceanfront paper streets as a public way and work with residents, including the adjacent lot owners, to make this public way as least obtrusive as possible. Please see how the stated wishes of the majority of the town council last week's workshop was forced off track by a minority of the town council members. You can fix this. You can have another workshop this month if you want to do what I see the majority of the town council members wanted to do at the last workshop. Then you could add this topic to the next town council meeting agenda. Remember, you have 1400 signatures on a petition demanding you accept these oceanfront paper streets. Opposing views have had years to come up with more than 1400 signatures to the contrary, but they have not. So it stands that the majority of Cape Elizabeth residents want you to accept Surfside Avenue and Atlantic Place paper streets. It is your job to act in the best interest of the general public and accept these paper streets. I have not seen any other issue taken up by the town council where the same arguments are repeated again and again and again year after year after year and the town council fails to do what the general public has made clear they want in this case accept these paper streets and be done with this topic accepting surfside avenue and atlantic place paper streets for a public way now puts the town in a better negotiating position this focuses discussion with adjacent land owners of how unobtrusive this public way can end up so do it and do it now. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Sarah? Thanks. Uh, Sarah McCall for Avon Road, and that's in Shore Acres. And I know you've all received a letter from me asking that this current council Ha, uh, should make the decision to accept the paper streets. But I'm really saying this for the public um, who are watching tonight. I too believe that there's such a high cost to continue to focus on this issue. Um, there are so many more pressing things that the council needs to get to. And I'd prefer that the new councilors use their energies um, to focus on those issues that come before them at that point. You guys have the breadth and the depth of knowledge because you've been dealing with it for so long as Jim Mora just mentioned. And so I'd like you to, to take a vote next month um, to accept the paper streets. <clears throat> and the only minor detail I really wanted to emphasize, I know you all know that I've been very clear about the appropriateness of accepting the paper streets for years and years and years. Um, what's what's something that people say a lot of the time is that I as a deed holder in Shore Acres have rights to the path um, and that is true but as a practical manner even legally I can walk there but I really won't don't think I'll be allowed to um, because the abutters really don't want people on the path and just a month ago, I rode my car down on Surfside on the dirt road. I actually am one of the people that has deeded rights to take a vehicle on that road. Um, and one of the property owners came out and told me that I needed to leave because I was in a car. So it's just prima facie that the people are going to deny me my rights to walk on the path, then I would also like to have it available to other people who do not have the deeded rights. So thanks for all your work. Sorry to go on and on. Please make sure that you accept the paper streets in the November meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Marianne. Thank you. Can you hear me? So I agree and hope that you will accept the paper uh, streets. But what I really wanted to talk with you about today was reopening the library. And I appreciate that Matt has already discussed that with you. 
I just wanted to bring to your attention and to the public's attention that across the state, libraries have employed simple measures to reopen safely. The use of hand sanitizers upon entry, required mask wearing, social distancing, and limited browsing, all measures have supported public health and support patron use. Scarborough, Cumberland, Yarmouth, Falmouth, Freeport, and Kennebunkport have all reopened for public browsing. Kennebunk and Brunswick have reopened on alternate days for public browsing. In those two libraries, there are public browsing use days alternating with curbside pickup days. So I respectfully request that the town reopen the library to public use and that if the town and library administrators choose to keep the library closed, I request that the council review this meeting, this decision at a regular open public meeting. As always, I thank you for your attention and your service. I know this has been a particularly challenging time for all of you. And uh, again, I can't say how much I appreciate your service. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Um, George. You may need to unmute yourself, George. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, my, my name is George Morse. I live at 1148 Shore Road. Um, and I uh, want to talk to you about the paper streets. Uh, as several others uh, said, uh, 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 I was pleased with your earlier um, stand to protect the town's right to uh, accept the paper streets, but uh, pretty disappointed in the decision on Wednesday when I sat, I sat in and listened to the discussion um, to, uh, to see that uh, you are thinking of kicking it down the road to the new, new council. And I think that's unfair to them and to uh, the large number of people in the community who uh, are in favor of your accepting those. And uh, it's been a few days since your workshop and uh, I've see, worked with many groups and seen many groups and uh, people change their minds sometimes. And I'm hoping that uh, since then a number of you have rethought the, the idea of kicking it down the uh, a road and uh, there's nothing wrong with changing your minds. You did it once before on this very issue and um, it's whether you get it right in the end. So what I am urging is that uh, uh, you put this on the November meeting agenda, uh, second that you vote to accept those two streets, Surfside and Atlantic Place, and then uh, include in the motion that the town will put in a simple walking path. I don't think you need to give all the details that can be developed over time, but also include that the town is willing to visit with each of the abutters during that planning process to get their, their input. So that's what I hope that you will, will do. I'm optimistic that you'll have had a chance to rethink this. And, uh, and finally, I thank you for your service overall for the, for the town. Thank you. Thank you. Jody? I'm Jody Burrow. I live at 5 Wombeck Road, and I have a question for the council. Um, I'm wondering who is going to explain tonight and share with the Cape community why the Paper Streets is not on tonight's agenda. Thank you. Um, John? Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Great. My name is John Bouchard. I live on 7 Winslow Place in Hobstone. 
Um, I've actually spoken to a couple of you, one by email and one by phone. I think Jeremy, you called me. I appreciate that. I'd just like to, um, to you know, um, chip in about adding hours to the in-person early voting. Um, I think that a lot, I'm retired, so it's easy for me to vote. And I did, I actually dropped in the voting box. But I think people um, who work would love to have weekend hours. Um, a lot of people I know don't want to vote on, on uh, election day for safety reasons. And I completely understand that. Um, personally, I didn't want to put my ballot, uh, my sacred ballot in a mail bin this year. I did put it in the drop box and it was picked up. So I appreciate that. But, um, you know, long and short, I'd really like to see hours extended at least to the, the weekends and maybe a couple of hours after work. And that's all I have to say. Priscilla? Hi, I'm Priscilla Armstrong. I live at 18 Avon Road in Shore Acres, and I too would like to urge you to finally place this uh, issue of the paper streets on Surfside Avenue and Atlantic Place on, on the November agenda. Um, I will say one of the very few bright lights of the COVID pandemic is that there have been a lot of um, people out walking in the neighborhood. And it's been very nice to hear people say hello to each other and just safely chit chat from a distance. And I think that the, some of the animosity in our neighborhood has faded away. But so I, I think that this is the time to really get that path going. Nobody has ever wanted anything more than a path much like the green bell paths, maybe three feet wide. I would be happy to volunteer to work with the abutters and any kind of town committee that looks at this, but it really is time to move on, deal with other aspects of whatever needs to be done in the town. So please put this on the November agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other citizen comment on items not on the agenda this evening? George? Hi there, George Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. Um, I agree with the other uh, people who've already spoken on the paper streets. Just wanted to add, add to that. And it's, I mean, the harassment from the neighbors that are down there has not stopped. I too drove down the gravel portion of Surfside Road and Mrs. Dunphy came out yelling at me and, and very, very slowly got out of the road so I could drive by. And my only response was to just smile and, and wave and, you know, I didn't yell back at her or say anything. It was just a nice, you know, I, I took basically her hollering at me as a hello. And, uh, but it doesn't stop. I mean, they've called uh, what is it, um, Augusta, to have people come down and, and um, when we were trying to finish clearing parts of the path quite a while ago because we do maintain it. And it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous that five people can cause such a disruption and cost this town so much money. Uh, you, you guys need to end it, please. Put the paper streets on the ballot next month or next meeting even and accept them. Agree to put in a path, talk to the neighbors if you want. If they don't want to see the path, they can put their own bushes in. You know, this, it's not a big deal. We want to be able to use what, as it was always intended since 1911. So please appreciate what you do, but don't pass it to another council and just drag this thing out. It's been painful enough as it's been for the last 50 years for me. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comment on items not on the agenda this evening? Okay. Uh, seeing no one, I, I just wanted to respond briefly to um, 
the paper streets issue that um, it it was generally the consensus of a majority of the council that there was a desire to accept the streets but um, on further discussion it seemed that for that majority um, their acceptance was conditioned on taking some further steps um, the first being to chat we don't we don't know if it will go anywhere, but to chat with the direct abutters um, and then moving on from there in the general direction of at some point putting that item on the agenda. Um, but that for for the majority of counselors who had indicated they were leaning towards acceptance that there were questions unanswered. So that's that's how we left things at that last meeting. Um, that this is not something we need to be rushing through, but something that we should be moving carefully through if it is eventually the intent of the council to accept. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. I did see Jamie has a Zoom hand up and Jeremy had his actual hand up. So um, Jeremy, you, you had your hand up first and then Jamie. Um, I, I just wanted to note for the benefit of folks watching at home that we have 33 attendees on the call now. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Jamie? Yeah, I, I think um, for reasons that I don't quite understand, um, the discussion we had last week um, has been misconstrued, misinterpreted to some degree. Um, I don't think it was just the consensus of a majority. I think it was unanimous of all of the counselors last week, myself included, um, that, uh, that continuing to move uh, in the direction of accepting the paper streets uh, is what we should do. I, I think all of us um, participated in an executive session meeting uh, where in that meeting we discussed various potential ramifications and impacts to legal strategy and, and things like that. And as a means of just simply weighing the risks and potential likely outcomes from any action that we take, my only suggestion was just to communicate to the litigants to see whether or not their position had changed at all since the two decisions that we've received in the town's favor um, have been made. Up until hearing from Attorney Israel last week, the town, to my knowledge, had not, I, I, I don't know if any other counselors did, I certainly hadn't heard from any abutting property owners, any of their representation, anything of the like. And I simply wanted to have an understanding, as was recommended by our council, just to reach out and see if their position had changed, as most people would uh, when considering the likelihood of any further legal action. Um, so if their position has not changed, we know that and we can take that into consideration as weighing that as one of the risks on whatever potential action we decide to take. So when we have that information, we can keep proceeding forward. Um, I think uh, there does still remain a, a, a bit of an unknown or, or murky question around um, the gravel paved portion of Surfside Avenue, which has been referenced twice here tonight, um, of people driving on it. Um, and I, I don't think I'm fully aware or the, the town's position is fully clear to the council about just what the, um, again, the, the ramifications are, if that portion is accepted, what we need to do uh, as far as it goes for designation, is the town in accepting it, taking over responsibility for ownership and plowing. There's a fee uh, ownership component there that does not exist in the, um, the unpaved portion. So just rushing into putting on an agenda for this month or November or whenever, when there still are just a few unanswered and loose end questions, I, I, don't, I, don't I don't understand why after all the time and effort that we've put into this up to this point to get us to where we are, we would risk letting something minor trip us up at the very end without being um, expressly deliberate about making sure all our, our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, so it, if, I, if I haven't made it clear to anybody listening, uh, you know, please, and, and, and I, I don't mean to speak for all of the rest of you on the call, but I, I listening back to the workshop or thinking, recalling back to the workshop last week, I don't recall any one of the seven of us saying that we weren't in favor of accepting. I recall uh, all of us um, coming to an agreement that based on, um, again, discussion that we had had in executive session, um, it just made sense to continue to proceed with a little bit of caution, 
uh, and gathering the fullest amount of the facts that we could possibly gather before taking our next action. So um, I, I hope that clarifies for the public any, any confusion or misunderstanding about what the position of this current council is. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, what Jamie said basically sums most of it up, but I just did want to reiterate the point um, that I don't think a majority of the council at any point said they support putting in a walking path per se. So I just wanted to, my, my counting, and again, uh, the, the record kind of speaks for itself, but I just <laughs> I want to be crystal clear, a majority of the council at no point during that meeting, to my recollection, and so if anyone was counting me as part of this, don't, uh, said walking path. So I think as J uh, Jamie just noted, a majority of the council may be saying, we will accept this as a public way uh, at some point in the future, but what that constitutes, what that the characteristics of that would be, what the, the contours of that are, is something that remains outstanding. And whether it's done as a road or, uh, or a walking path or anything else, there has not been majority action. There has not been a majority consensus from my perspective uh, on a walking path. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and that's it. Thanks, Chris. Um, okay. So we are moving on to the town manager's report, please. I had to unmute myself. I apologize for the delay. Just a moment. I lost my page here for a second. I apologize. That's okay. Take your time. I don't know what the heck I did here. Should we move on to review the draft minutes while you're relocating it? If you'd be so kind, <laughs> I'm just trying to, uh, I put it on the bottom of my margin and uh, I, I have pull, pushed it where I, I cannot pull it back up. So I'm just trying to grab it back up now. Okay, so we, we will need a roll call in a minute, but we'll take up some time at least getting this started. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, so we'll move on to review of draft minutes. There are two um, virtual meetings, September 14th, 2020, and September 28th, 2020, which was a special meeting. Um, and we are looking for a motion to approve um, the draft minutes from those two meetings. Do I have a motion? Jeremy, thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Valerie Devereaux, thank you. Any discussion on those draft minutes? Nope. All right. Um, could we have the roll call, please, Matt? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Councillor Devereaux? Yes. Councillor Gabrielson? Yes. Councillor Garvin? Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councillor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Adams? Yes. Thank you. Um, still looking for your page? For some reason. Uh, I cannot get the darn thing to, to go or need to, but I can, I can summarize it pretty quickly as well. Um, let's see here, sorry. I had a dream about this about four this morning that I was running into problems with <laughs> during this meeting and it came to fruition. So I apologize for the delay. Uh, yes, I, to, to begin, I'd like to uh, let everyone know that the town uh, shall be expanding its, its in-person uh, voting hours effective tomorrow morning. Uh, 
initially our hours were going were, were at 9 a.m. until 11:30, uh, and then 1:15 until 3 p.m. Uh, what we've done since then is expand those hours to be uh, uh, as of tomorrow we will expand that to starting at 8 a.m. Uh, till 11:30, and then 1:15 to 3:30 p.m., adding effectively an hour and a half uh, per day. And there we go. Okay, uh, so I had to work around. Uh, so we'll be adding an hour and a half per day. So that is a, a, a change in the hours that we have. The, the, the desire is that this will meet the demand for those who prefer to vote absentee in person instead of via the mail, in person drop off, or our newly installed vote drop box. This schedule allows a half hour in the morning for election staff to come in, set up for voters, continue processing the submitted ballots from the prior day. With the 1130 end to the morning session, this allows staff to assist those who are currently in line at that time to also vote prior to noon. Uh, the one hour break at noon allows election staff to grab uh, the opportunity to have lunch, uh, take bio breaks and what, what they need to do, return by one, set up for the afternoon, and then assist voters until 3.30. This also gives those still in line the opportunity to vote similar to the morning prior to the building closing at 4 p.m. for the day. Finally, on October 30th, the last day for absentee voting in person, the town will be able to assist voters from 8 to 11.30 a.m. and then from 1.15 until 5 p.m. As of close of business today, the town has sent out close to 5,000 absentee ballots. Of those 5,000, in excess of 2,000 of those absentee ballots have been returned to to the town in the first week. Of those returned, over 1,900 were returned by the newly installed drop box in front of town hall. 130 people have voted in person, an average of 33 per day, or roughly about five per hour. With the remainder choosing to hand them to an elections clerk or an elections worker at the front door. Voters have apparently embraced the drop box option as a safe, secure, and socially distant option. And this option is one that we encourage as the safest way to vote in this age of COVID-19. It has been encouraging to watch voters taking selfies with the drop box over the past few days. With an estimated number of 6,500 to 7,000 voters in the town of Cape Elizabeth, it's estimated that when voting is complete, 80 plus percent of voters will have voted by the absentee process, with the majority employing the drop box option if the trends continue, which I have no reason to think they won't. And if the current trend continues, we anticipate that roughly 400 people, 400 voters will choose to vote the in-person option, roughly seven to eight percent of total registered voters. It is a steadfast desire to provide all who wish to vote every opportunity to exercise their right to vote. And based on Cape Elizabeth's strong tradition of high percentage of voter turnout, it is our desire that the additional time daily will increase the voters' options. Respectfully submitted. I, I hope that provides uh, a good perspective as to what, how people are voting in town. Um, the other thing I will say is the, the staff, and especially Deb and her staff, if there's a desire to vote, we're finding a way to make that happen. Uh, you know, until we adjusted the hours for tomorrow, we had a, a, a voter called yesterday at three, uh, 10 past three in the morning, in the afternoon, sorry. And, uh, and spoke, you know, called in, said, I'd like to vote. And Deb said, well, are you in the, uh, are you in the parking lot? She said, yes, yes, I am. Well, she went out and she, she they, got, they got the person in, they get her to vote. Um, obviously, we're not gonna draw a hard line at that 3.30 hour or at, at the 11.30 hour. Uh, it allows you to, to, in a sense, do the run out uh, as, uh, as a, I think was a great term to, uh, to employ to describe that. Uh, so we can help those folks who do, because you don't want to cut a hard line. And if we need to go a little bit over, we will go a little bit over. Uh, but holy cow, if you look at the numbers, people are all about the Dropbox. I mean, it's safe, it's secure. Uh, we do have, I will say, it is probably one of the safest and most secure spots outside of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department uh, uh, station building because 
it's I mean it's right there in front of, of the town office. The police department is across the street, and we've in, and we've installed security cameras to make sure that no one uh, attempts to uh, attempts to bother with the with the with the drop boxes. So uh, it's been I mean that's been and this is the first year that that's been an available option, and people really have taken to it. And I, I and it's it's our gratitude to all the voters who have come out so far and and they're doing it because eight votes i mean i entered into uh for lack of a better term a gentleman's uh uh wager with the managers from uh yarmouth and cumberland and falmouth uh as to uh who who will have a highest per higher percentage of of voters and uh let's just say i, I don't think that uh, i mean as a gentleman's wager so there's nothing involved but uh outside of pride, but I would say at this point in time, my pride is uh, is securely intact as far as my faith in the Cape voters, because you got, they, they do a tremendous job, but that's an amazing thing to receive 2,000 of 5,000 votes back within the first seven days. And I think we'll, I mean, we'll see that trend continue and we'll, we'll get folks done and, and get their votes ready to go. And the other thing is, there's a misconception and, you know, and to everybody's defense, if you watch the news, they have different ways to describe the process in 50, you know, it's 50 different ways in 50 different states as how people vote. In some states, they call it early voting. Maine, it's no excuse uh, or, 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 or no excuse required absentee voting suit. So it's been available. Maine has been at the forefront of providing that as an opportunity. And Deb Lane and her staff have, have been right on the edge of the edge of the tip on that. So uh, I think you know, they're doing a great job. They're getting it out there. People are, are really are really flocking to it. And uh, we hope that the additional hour and a half per day will allow folks to do that, especially for the early. The early morning hours are, are I think, might be more beneficial than the late, uh, than the late hours. But uh, staff is working and we we're fully staffed, but they are working, you know, they're not just walking out of the door at four, four in the afternoon. Uh, they're here oftentimes till 5 30 6 o'clock at night they're putting in a couple extra hours uh, per day if not more and I know uh, Deborah and uh, Kathy Maxwell deputy clerk are putting in well in advance of that as well as here on weekends to help process and make sure those ballots are secure and brought in and, and taken under under the town's control so uh, they're out there multiple times a day uh, because they want it to be successful as well and they that's their service and they want to they want to serve the town townspeople uh, to the best of that the level of what they anticipate and expect. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Matt. And so just to clarify in case there was anyone, if there's anyone listening or watching in the future, that Dropbox, um, as you noted, is being processed daily, if not multiple times a day, by the clerk's office. Um, and that's part of what is taking so much time to process these, because you said it's almost 2,000 ballots via the Dropbox. Yeah, and ultimately they're about a day behind uh, as far as, you know, just, I mean, the processing process. So today, you know, what they receive today will be processed tomorrow, as well as what they receive during the day from the Dropbox side of it. But people can confirm that. I know online it takes maybe, it's probably a 24 hour period later when they can look at the confirmation that has taken place. Uh, you know, but the Dropbox is great. I mean, I, I have a high level of confidence in it and much better, I mean, for all, all due respect to the Postal Service, much better than that because it's right there. It's it's direct delivery and it's safe. And it's, yeah, it's, and, you know, and it's without the drama of worrying about, about it not arriving in time. Um, Penny, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of piggyback on, um, the gentleman's comment about weekends and, uh, evenings as we, as we head toward the 3rd of November, um, more and more people are potentially going to take advantage of, uh, early voting. And I, I agree that, um, uh, and I recognize that more people are uh, working from home, but there are still people out there who uh, have to go to work and work eight to five, um, seven days a week, or five days a week, sorry, I work seven days a week, five days a week. Um, 
is there a potential that for um, the, the upcoming Saturday and the Saturday before the third that we could make an option available that uh, there will be some hours on weekends and could there be the potential that uh, the week of the 26th that there be some um, some evening hours um, I just know that uh, there are probably people out there who would who would potentially take advantage of that if and I recognize Matt if we we do see a trend that we're going to have a lot of votes in before uh, well before the third uh, or a lot of ballots in well before the third but I think to kind of cast the net a little more could we potentially think about something like that has it been discussed we we, we have discussed it um, I, I don't think the numbers bear out uh, quite frankly, when you look at the numbers of folks who have been using the Dropbox option uh, compared to those who show up, we might pick up 30. I mean, not to say that every vote isn't sacred, but uh, we're definitely getting more, uh, a, a higher number of, or higher percentage of uh, voters through via the Dropbox, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, up until uh, up until the election, basically. So. Uh, that's probably the, the greatest option. And, uh, you know, some towns have done that, uh, have have offered a couple of Saturdays, and, uh, and some of those towns are uh, uh, don't offer the, the five days a week that we have. So every town has a different flavor as to how they've approached it. Some of the larger jurisdictions obviously have, have, have larger, uh, you know, has larger days just because of the sheer volume. Uh, but this seems to, I don't know, I, it seems to be the Dropbox and the other is there. And, uh, you know, I think staff, it, it, I, I'm concerned at that point that, you know, would you want to sacrifice one of the days during the week in order to do a Saturday versus do it, uh, you know, on the other part. So um, when, when we are, when they are just overwhelming the Dropbox with, uh, with that approach, the in-person really, uh, I mean, I understand it's, it may be a preferential thing, but there, there is still election day. Uh, uh, for what it's worth, uh, as a, there won't be very many. I'm just, these, these numbers won't I'm be many gonna, voters on election day. I'm just going to say that I truly believe the hours are based on a um, an an eight to four proposition, and yeah. um, the world. Everybody in the world doesn't work like that. Everybody in the world doesn't have the flexibility to uh, leave work and and go vote. And there are people out there, and maybe we're making assumptions about uh, people in Cape Elizabeth are going to uh, request their their ballots and then drop them in the drop box. But I think there is a an element of the population that uh, may want to vote in person, um, and this gives them the opportunity to do that. And um, and I hate to say it because this is just who I am. I wasn't asking to give up a day. I'm asking to add a day. I know, I know, and, it, and I think it's a tough. I think it's a tough match. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I obviously can can discuss it with Deborah. But uh, I, yeah. If you can prove to me the trend is moving us toward a greater percentage of uh, participation, um, then I I might kind of back up a bit. But I truly believe that. The world, everybody in the world does not work on an eight to five. Um, Chris had his hand up and then I see you, Valerie, I'll get to you next. Uh, yeah, so um, I'll take the trade off if that's the option. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess the key for me is uh, what we're facing is with COVID, the flow rate, the number of uh, voters we can process per hour at the voting uh, on election day is potentially much lower than normal. So let's say we normally could handle 500 voters an hour. Uh, if now it's dropped to 100 voters an hour because of COVID, and I don't know what the number is, but presumably it's some lower number. If that's the case, by offering hours continuously beforehand for people that want to do in-person voting, we're taking the pressure off the midday hours, but we're not necessarily taking pressure off the 
uh, the morning and the uh, evening hours. So if we have a large number of people attempt to show up to vote, but we can only process 100 an hour, and there's 1,000 people waiting there at 5 o'clock, we're looking at a 10-hour line. And that's, that's the concern. So for me, I would throw away one of these midweek days in exchange for a weekend day because the goal for me would be to alleviate the flow pressure we may have on election day by virtue of the COVID restrictions. Hmm. Um, Valerie? I, I agree with Chris. And why haven't we talked about expanding evenings? Uh, we're closing at 3.30. Why don't we have two evenings a week, something like that to where people who aren't getting off work at five or six o'clock, they can still come in and vote. That would relieve some pressure too. So that might be an easier way, um, adding hours in the evening so that we can reduce that pressure that Chris was talking about. So um, in chatting with Matt and Matt sort of conveying what, what's going on with Deb and the election clerks, um, they're already staying late to process the ballots received. So it seems like expanding the midweek hours would be untenable. But I wonder if we, as Chris suggested, eliminate a, mid, a midweek day, which would then give them a day off to do a significant amount of processing and add like a weekend or even a half day on a weekend or a few hours in the middle of the day on a weekend, something like that, um, so that voters could come in then, which may then to you know eliminate a day in the week, or at least you know a portion of the day, give them more time to process things in one chunk of time, which may be a little more efficient for them. I'm not sure how it works, and I'm sure that you know Matt has something to say on this. <laughs> um, I don't, I, so if you added two hours at the end of the day, you might be looking at 12 people. When you, you know, during last week, I think the first, the first half of the first day, I think we took in somewhere around 400 ballots in the drop box. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think Deb and the election staff came up with an excellent plan. I think it's been working extremely well uh, as it goes along here. And I think, I mean, if you, if you think that, you know, let's say 80%, let's say we have 6,500 voters and 80% of them are going to vote. So we're closing in on the amount of people who normally vote right now who, are, who have already got absentee ballots in their hand with 5,000 ballots already out. Um, I think election day is probably gonna be pretty quiet outside of, uh, outside of those who do come, but, I, but it'll be nowhere as near where we looked at before. If you've got 5,000 votes that are coming through uh, and will be here on or before October 30th and processed uh, starting that, uh, well, that, you know, they'll be starting to be processed on the Tuesday before the election. I don't. I don't know. I. Th I think the plan that they have has been has has worked, uh, quite frankly. Um, and I. There are only and there are only so many hours of the day, and there are only so many folks who we have working for us. But I think where we've been and and, and please don't. I mean, we've looked at this a million different ways. So don't take it as that I'm, tr I'm trying to be intransigent or or difficult at all, uh, because. I've worked with you now for, for a while, and uh, that's just not how I'm wired. Uh, but I think you know we've got a, we have a we have a town clerk who's who's done this for 32 years and lives and dies by the town uh, to try to make sure this the job's done right. And I think I think she's done it done it uh, and and planned it the best way that's that seems to be working. Uh, you know, for the you know. If it wasn't, I mean, with all due respect to the dozen or so emails that the council may, has, may have received uh, on this, and there's 9,500 people approximately in town, uh, I, I think the solution that, that, that we've come up with is probably, will probably work. Uh, 
I know there are some who, who don't agree, but uh, there are there are items that come before the council that uh, you know there is there is uh, party disagreement on, and uh, council may make a decision that is not in uh, in line with what others may extend they want to have for the, the decision. So I don't know. I, I mean, right now I, I think it's working. It seems to be working extremely well when we have. You know, 40% of the ballots have come back via the uh, via the drop box, and I think it'll continue. Uh, and people have been pretty good. I mean, I, I will say to this, Debbie Debbie's phone's blowing up on a daily basis just with people confused by what's going on with the ranked choice voting thing. Uh, you know, how to do that? We've had spoiled ballots there, uh, so we've had to work with voters there to try to to help them in that case. Uh, you know, we're, they're doing everything uh, outside of moving heaven and earth to uh, to help folks uh, get through this successfully. Uh, and then and then you've got and then you have the you know the disinformation that is out there uh, that comes from multiple sources that doesn't make it any easier for voters to to try to do what they want to do. As well as people are concerned. I mean, many folks if they do come, they want to come and pick up a ballot in hand, then they take it home, and then they come back and they put it in the drop box. Um, that's what that that's been our experience as well with the you know with the six or so per hour who have come during the day. Thanks, Matt. And like I said earlier, we I'm I am so appreciative of the work Debbie does and the clerks and it sounds like you guys have really been working hard on this and considered a lot of options. <laughs> well, due respect, Madam Chair, for about two years, uh, you know, and that was prior to COVID. <laughs> the COVID thing is, uh, and we, we were grateful for the test drive in July, which seemed to work extremely well. Also, and that was pre Dropbox, uh, and things things went went well then. And I mean, this is obviously the the stakes are much greater with this election, and I think if you, only if you're a robot, you don't get that. Uh, so I think there's just that that side of it, and I, I I understand. I'm just as concerned as everybody else is uh, with my own vote. But uh, you know, I I voted and I I dutifully dropped it in the absentee bo box up in gray, and uh, it seemed to work work fairly well. And for our older population, the drop box has been a a, a godsend because they don't have to interact with anybody. They can come and drop it off, and uh, it's the safest safest manner. So. I'm open to any suggestion, but we're, you know we've got two, basically two and a half weeks left of voting, and, uh, and what we've had so far seems to have been has 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 worked uh, very very well. And You're muted. I I know I I'm mute and then I mute and mute again. Uh, Jamie, did you have a uh, question? Um, I just I. I wanted to clarify um, whose actual decision this is because um, I, I think obviously our role as counselors is to advocate for um, you know positions of constituents and, and, and things like that but I, I don't think that the council has any um, sort of statutory role in determining this right so I mean we can provide concerns and direction and things like that but uh, is that correct Matt? The uh, elections are run by the clerk. Uh, yep, that is correct. But it it, it also doesn't mean that uh, we don't have seven council members who we uh, whose opinions and input we take extremely uh, close to heart and and seriously. So yeah, no, my my question is more for um, the public who's raised the questions to us and and um, some of the emails that I know that we've gotten and and like I said, you know, happy to take a position of advocating. For those concerns, um, but I just wanted to clarify that it's it's not statutorily our um, you know our our position or our our decision to make. So I'm just trying to clarify that for folks. And if it may be helpful, uh, Councilor Garvin as well. Uh, I know Deborah is in close conversations with the Secretary of State's office, especially with Julie Flynn, who is. Uh, in many ways, the guru of elections uh, for Secretary of State Dunlap's office, and uh, everything that has that you know for the program and the plan that has been put forth so far have been uh, brought forward with the blessing of 
of the Secretary of State's office when it comes to voting and uh, and running the polls. So uh, everything she has done is by strictly by the book. Um, Chris. Uh, yeah, so Matt, totally appreciate everything you said there and uh, very appreciative of all the hard work you're all putting in. Uh, with respect to the, the hours provided, I guess, I just wanted to reiterate the point that what we've done is we've set aside a number of midday hours. So um, across two, two weeks uh, for people where that fits their schedule and they want to vote in person. But for people that work during the day and are still having to go into the office during COVID, we've set aside no hours uh, prior to that nine, whatever, it, or after that three o'clock. And that, uh, that I think was the concern. So for me, just a single day, because what I, I want to avoid is I want to avoid people coming af uh, uh, after the election, basically, or, uh, or election night saying, hey, I went to, I'm, I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth, I went to vote and I had to wait 10 hours in line. Hopefully that's not going to happen. Hopefully total, not a problem at all. But if that does happen, I want to at least be able to say with a straight face to them, you had the option to vote in person uh, during hours that worked for you at least once, at least once prior to election day. So that, that's why if it was just one Saturday or one week weekday uh, until seven or eight or whatnot, it just at least once I could say to them, you had another opportunity to do it and to have avoided the lines as opposed to saying you had no other opportunity if you wanted to vote in person. Your only option was this day when there was a 10 hour line. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris. I appreciate that. I'm Councilor Straw, sorry. Okay. Um, anybody else on this point? No. And I, I would also just note, I, although I do recognize what, what you're saying, Chris, and what um, we've heard via email, but I actually haven't heard from a single person who said, I want to vote during these hours and I am unable to do so. Is there another option available? So I, it may be that this is a lot of discussion on a non-issue for people, especially given the large number of people who are comfortable using the Dropbox. Um, so who knows, but thank you for listening to all of us, Matt, and thank you, thank you for, for working on that issue. No, I, I greatly appreciate the uh, thoughts and I'll, I'll, I'll speak with Deborah as well tomorrow and uh, bring up to speed as to where the council, uh, the council discussion went and apologize, probably the on record, the longest town managers report that I've ever submitted. So uh, thank you for all of your comments as well. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, okay, so actually getting into the, the meat of the agenda now and 20 past eight. Um, the public hearing on tacos e tequila liquor license. Um, so this is an item on our agenda. And just to, to intro it before opening up comments. Um, a new on-premises malt liquor, wine and spirits license had been submitted for approval from tacos e tequila, Cape Elizabeth Inc. located at 517 Ocean House Road. A public hearing has been duly noticed in the Press Herald and posted at Town Hall in compliance with state, hall, state law and town ordinance. Um, no concerns have been raised by the police chief, fire chief, and code enforcement officer. So there is a public hearing scheduled for this evening. I'll now open comments. Anyone from the public wishing to comment, please try to limit your comments to about three minutes and identify yourself by name and address or local affiliation if that is relevant. Seeing no comments, I will close the public hearing and we will move on to the agenda item. Um, looking for a motion of the council after having held a public hearing to approve the new malt, liquor, wine, and spirits license for Tacos e Tequila, Cape Elizabeth, Inc., located at 517 Ocean House Road as presented. So moved. Thank you, Penny. Is there a second? Jeremy, okay. thank you. Any discussion on this item? I'm so excited that there's a restaurant going in there. I think this is fabulous. So 
anyway, thank you. Jamie? Um, I think I was going back into the, I was trying to find it from previous meetings. I think within the last year, we, we approved renewal of a liquor license for the same location. Does this now, um, this now supersedes that? It's a different business. It's not, um, okay. Yes, it's a separate application and it's been, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a separate application. So the other one, it will kind of basically go to the wayside, so. Okay. Okay, uh, there's no further discussion. Uh, yes, Valerie. My understanding is um, this is a um, tenant in the building. Is that correct, Matt? Uh, he, uh, it's my understanding as well that uh, uh, Mr. Bravo will be uh, leasing the restaurant space. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah not not in own, not yet. Uh, the, the facility is still owned by by a diff, by uh, the current owner, but I understand that he'll be leasing the space. Okay. All right. If there's no further discussion, could we have the roll call, please, Matt? Mr. Mayor, Madam Chair, uh, Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Adams? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, next up, we have a public hearing on the general assistant appendices. Um, you can find those in the materials for this evening. Um, on September 14th, 2020, the council set to public hearing the general assistance ordinance appendices A through H as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association effective October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. Uh, we will now open the public hearing and again, um, please try to limit your comments to about three minutes. Identify yourself as name and address and local affiliation if relevant. Seeing no one, and I'll just note that we have about, we have 18 attendees right now. Um, seeing no one will close the public hearing. Um, so, we are looking for a motion of the council after having held a public hearing to approve the general assistance ordinance appendices A through H as recommended by the Maine Municipal Association effective October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Jamie. Is there a second? Penny, thank you. Uh, any discussion on this item? Valerie, yes. Um, I just wanted to be clear. It says um, that we're approving the appendix um, A through H. However, we haven't um, yet chosen our appendix A or our appendix C housing. So I wanted to be clear um, which metropolitan area we're going to be for our um, appendix, appendix A before we vote on it. I'm guessing we're using the Portland HMFA. Is that correct? That, that's correct, Councilor Devereaux. Uh, the Portland HMFA uh, on, that, on that grid. And then um, for the housing, the Appendix C, um, there's two options. One is, um, are we adopting Portland or are we adopting um, Cumberland County figures? After looking at it, I thought possibly the Portland figures are more in line with Cape Elizabeth housing rather than the Cumberland County figures. That, that would be correct as well, Councilor Devereaux, uh, on that uh, with the housing figures. We are part of the Portland uh, metropolitan region. Is that something the council needs to weigh in on or is it something that, that will just be that's what Chose. we would employ. Um, yeah, that would, that's what we would employ when, when applying the maximums. Okay, so we'll okay. use the Portland, adopt Portland figures. Okay. 
All right. Uh, Penny? Uh, there I am. Um, I think I asked this question prior, be, before, and it's about Appendix I, about misconduct. It's this misconduct of people who are administering general assistance, or what is it? If, if I may, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Jordan. I am uh, prepared to answer your question after uh, consulting with the Maine Municipal Association's attorneys the next day after the last time we reviewed this. So uh, the misconduct is, uh, it's, uh, it's put in the Model G or GA ordinance. And this is the definition of mis misconduct that is used uh, for purposes of the GA work requirement that exists out there. It's not on the, uh, the person administering the uh, the general assistance, it's actually on those looking to uh, accept it. And uh, state law provides that an applicant, uh, whether initial or repeat uh, applicant, uh, who quits work or is discharged uh, from employment due to misconduct, which is the definition that they have now updated in the in this section of the ordinance, uh, is ineligible to receive assistance for up to or for 120 days after their separation from employment. And then instead of establishing a new def definition of misconduct for this purpose, uh, they, the ordinance and the GA statute borrow the definition from the state unemployment law and specifically to that definition of misconduct. So uh, yeah, it's not on the part of the person administering it, uh, which is, you know, if you read that, it can be read both ways, but their clarification mm -hmm. is relating to specifically with when a person is pursuing GA and they, they were terminated or left their work due to misconduct. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. That's what I dropped a second ago, so I had to pick it up. Um, I have a question also. Um, last year, I believe, we did not adopt Appendix C. We just uh, were able to use the overall maximums. Um, do, you have, do you know, Matt, whether that proved helpful or made a difference at all? You know, I apologize I, for not asking you earlier today, and I didn't occur to me until later. Chair Adams, you have nothing to apologize for because I uh, anticipated the question for sure would be coming, and uh, have found for the past two years that uh, by using the uh, the locally determined, I think it has worked better for uh, those folks who are are looking for that. The maximums that they have identified are close, but uh, having the flexibility for the GA administrator to meet the needs of those pursuing assistance has, uh, I think that's allowed them the flexibility to, uh, to use the maximum but employed in the areas that it may make the, make the provide the best benefit. So right. that would be adopting, not adopting Appendix C? Correct, correct. Because I think the rents are, the rents are where they're at uh, today. So we find that, you know, for the past year, I, I keep a fairly close eye on that and have since the initial discussion, or at least quite frankly, since I've been manager, but uh, looking at what the uh, what the GA amounts that do go to paying rent, uh, I think it'd be best to use the locally uh, derived numbers as well. Okay. So if you wanted to uh, adopt all but C uh, and wanted to make such a uh, uh, an amended motion, that that would probably clarify uh, take care of that if, if that was so the desire of the council. Um. I am right now totally blanking on procedure and trying to save Matt the roll call twice for an amendment and a motion. If it's seconded, can it be withdrawn? I, I, Madam Chair, I, I don't mind uh, doing the roll call twice if, uh, okay. <laughs> if I'm here to, here to serve. Okay. Um, so the current motion is to approve appendices A through H. Um, I guess I would move an amendment um, to appendices A, B, not C, and then the remainder through H. Um, or A through, for, for ease of of recording, we'll say A through H with the exclusion of C. Second. 
Um, okay. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? Okay, uh, Matt, could we have a roll call, please? Of course, Madam Chair. Yeah, Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan. Yes. Councilor Straw. Yes. Chairman Adams. Yes. Motion. Uh, the amended motion uh, carries, and now you have the uh, the initial. If uh, if you so choose, would you like me to call the roll on that as well, Madam Chair, or would you like to have further discussion? If there's any further discussion, you can take that up now. But otherwise, roll call, please. Thank you, uh, Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan. Yes. Councilor Straw. Yes. And Chair Adams. Yes. Both carry unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item 129-2020, request for a speed limit reduction on Wood Road, Ivy Road, Rocky Road, High Bluff Road, and Glendon Road. Um, before I open this up for uh, public comment, I understand that um, Councillor Garvin may wish to bring something up. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, Chairman Adams. Um, I spoke to the chair earlier today, and I think um, it makes sense for me to recuse myself from this item. Um, I uh, do feel that I would be able to um, discuss it without bias, but I, I think there would be a perception perhaps among people um, in the public uh, because of the proximity of many of the streets uh, that are being brought forward here, as well as uh, relationships with uh, some of the principals involved in organizing this that um, that uh, I'd somehow be benefiting. So uh, with that, I'm gonna recuse myself from this item. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will open this, com this item for public comment. Um, we do have 19 attendees at this point. Please use the raise hand feature. Identify yourself um, by name and address for the record, please. Randy. Can you hear me? Perfect, Randy. Geez, Matt, uh, I've been sitting through the, the, the agenda so far and all I thought you had to do was work with me. <laughs> You're a good man, Randy. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize for all the time I've, uh, I and, and the neighbors have taken of your time and appreciate all that you and uh, Chief Fenton have done to uh, move the uh, safety concerns forward. Uh, and uh, I know we've been indicting you with uh, emails and photos and things. So, uh, you know, I prepared a, a presentation and I sent that to you, and I believe you may have forwarded that to the town council members. Yes. So rather than reading that verbatim, um, hopefully they understand the issue. The, the issue has been transitioning as I've worked with DOT and the town, you know, Matt and Chief Fenton, and, uh, you know, the definition of the narrow street really uh, helps our arguments for the reducing the speeds from what is designated as an unposted speed of 25 miles an hour down to hopefully 15 miles per hour. So let me give you a, a brief summary here. Uh, let me first start by, you know, I'm almost 75 years old and I've lived in this neighborhood a long time. My children have grown, uh, although I do have four grandchildren in the neighborhood. So my, you know, they're always, they're, their safety is always a concern. But I have a lot of friends and uh, I see these children playing in the neighborhood day in and day out as the uh, email said, uh, you know, on, I, on Rocky Hill Road alone, there are 22 kids under the age of 12 years old. And they're always playing into the streets because of the, uh, the, the, you know, the small lot sizes of the homes. I became sensitive to this probably, uh, 15, 16 years ago, I was driving a truck up Ivy Road and I was probably doing seven, eight, nine miles an hour. And as I was coming up over the hill, there was a truck parked there and 
just before I got to the side of the, uh, the door of that truck that was parked there, a uh, little two, probably three years old at the most, stepped out in front of me. And if I, <clears throat> if I had been doing any more than that speed, I, I probably would have hit her. And she uh, just graduated from Cape High School. So with her in mind, and my own grandchildren in mind, and seeing all these other kids in mind, I've had conversations over the years with neighbors trying to uh, reduce the speed limit. Uh, we've been pretty effective at uh, yelling at people uh, because you, when you have to yell because they don't stop, stop and roll their window down. And those that do, we talk to them and we go to neighbors' houses. And we've been pretty effective at communicating the concerns for speed. Uh, and our feeling is that most people in the neighborhood now drive at what I deem as a safe speed, 10 to 15 miles an hour. I tried to do 20 miles an hour up uh, Wood Road the other day. And I said, you know, this is too scary. So we are asking the town council because of the configuration of the road. Uh, hopefully, you, you know, I know Jamie's familiar and uh, Penny's been through the neighborhood. Caitlin's a lifelong resident of the Cape. They've been through this neighborhood and they can see there's hills, there's very short site distances. And as stated in the uh, letter, we've had two landscape architects uh, one who lives in the road in the neighborhood say that these roads are unsafe at the 25 mile per hour limit and under current zoning and uh, uh, land use uh, regulations the configuration of these roads would not be permitted i think we probably sent some photos to matt today showing the uh, the roads uh, maybe they get out to the uh, town council members i don't know um, but a gentleman and myself, we took, uh, so going back a little bit, the, uh, you know, as we've been going through this, DOT plays a significant role in determining this. So I've probably read over a hundred pages of DOT regulations, watch their videos on how their speed limits are, uh, are calculated. And so I've been pretty involved with DOT and found them to pretty helpful. And as we've been going through, I sent a first summary letter, uh, but things have changed significantly since then, <clears throat> significantly since then, that uh, one day on the phone call with the DOT engineer, uh, he said to me, you know, let me bring up these roads. And he brought them up on his computer and he said, we have never done a traffic study on those roads. And then he said to me, well, let me measure them and somehow he could measure them from his computer. And he said, a lot of those are narrow roads under 18 feet and width with two-way traffic. <clears throat> and he says, DOT does not have jurisdiction over those roads. The town does and can post a advisory speed limit, you know, a narrow road speed limit. They can have an advisory speed limit and it can be a number that is reasonable. And the neighbors think that 15 miles an hour is reasonable. Um, so I think we've, you know, we, we have submitted to uh, Matt uh, a petition. You know, we met with Matt and Chief uh, Fenton had a, a nice uh, Zoom session. <clears throat> I still have a lot to learn how to run these Zoom sessions. Uh, followed up with a letter and then a subsequent letter. You know, we sent, uh, we sent a letter summarizing our request and then a subsequent letter showing, uh, demonstrating support. And we had 95, 96, <clears throat> excuse me, 96 signatures from the neighbors, which represents almost 90% of the houses in the neighborhood. Uh, we called on a few houses. One gentleman has cancer. We did not want to bother him. Another one was a rental. Uh, and another one we called on a couple of times. They have not been home we can easily get over the 90% figure. I think we've had one person <clears throat> object to the, uh, to the request. And that is probably because I irritated him by suggesting he was going too fast up uh, uh, High Bluff Road. And as you look at High Bluff Road, at the top of it, it goes from about 17 feet down to 
10 or 11 feet. You cannot pass a UPS truck up, a UPS, a FedEx truck takes the whole road. So I think we've demonstrated uh, the neighborhood support. Uh, there was a concern I felt as we were working with Chief Fenton and Matt about the uh, <clears throat> town taking on the responsibility of uh, setting speed limits on the side streets because of potential liability and other issues. Uh, the DOT uh, in my, and I, and I sent some of this information to Chief uh, uh, Fenton and Matt Sturgis, uh, <clears throat> clarifies that the setting the road is as a narrow road does not uh, place the responsibility on the town. It's just that the DOT will not post speed limits on those towns, but they recommend that the town post a sign that says narrow roads with an advisory speed limit, which we want at 15, and I'll come back to that. And uh, it is not an enforceable speed limit. So the police department is not burdened with an additional enforcement. Although as a sidelight, I've sort of looked back, you know, I'm an, almost a lifelong resident in the Cape. And my memory, I look back and, you know, occasionally I read the Cape Courier and look at traffic summonses and all the police things. And I cannot recall one police arrest ticketing or anything on the side roads in our neighborhood. So I'm, we see their presence here all the time, which we appreciate. Uh, but I just do not think, you know, one, there's not enough distances to get a good radar measurement on anybody going fast in this neighborhood because of the, uh, the short sight distances, the hills and things. So I don't think the request to reduce the speed limit to uh, 15 miles an hour with an advisory uh, under the narrow road advisory will be burdensome to the town. Uh, I've also sensed a little concern that the town had about other neighborhoods requesting this uh, with the uh, DOT really having jurisdiction over this and other towns, uh, other neighborhoods would have to demonstrate a similar situation of narrow roads and uh, uh, bad, uh, you know, geo, uh, geo, uh, bad road layout, poor, lay poor, poor road layout. Uh, so there's a threshold that they would have to overcome. There are a couple of neighborhoods such as Delano Park and the neighborhood uh, which has dirt roads out beyond the ice cream store uh, by uh, Crescent Beach. Uh, they are not town roads, but yet the neighbors in that, those communities have set speed limits of 15 and 10 miles an hour, recognizing the risk of the configuration of those, road, those roads to the children and the pedestrians in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I, I've been plowing through and I just finished reading a very boring uh, uh, report from the uh, national, uh, uh, the uh, uh, national uh, highway safety things and <clears throat> One of the things that popped out to me was, and I don't understand all the measurements, but doing a, a speed of 15 miles per hour, the stopping distance is 75 feet. Uh, we do not have a, a sight distance of 75 feet on our roads. If you're doing 25 miles an hour, the stopping distance is 150 feet. And 150 feet, uh, we certainly don't have that, that sight distance on uh, many of our roads. You go over a hill, you you're lucky if you have size distance of 20 feet. So, you know, it's, it, you know, we've taken 46 measurements and I think that's in the report we gave you. Uh, I would expect the town and DOT would want to, uh, you know, verify those measurements to make sure we're not lying and cheating on them. Um, so, we as a, uh, a neighborhood uh, are requesting that the uh, <clears throat> town uh, ex post the roads as narrow roads with an advisory speed limit of 15 miles an hour. Even though it's not enforceable, it does give the neighbors a basis for going to a neighbor and saying, we think you're going too fast. You know, 
they can drive whatever speed they want and we can't enforce it and neither can the police. But I think social pressure uh, has been very effective in the neighborhood. I know people have been arguing this for a long Randy, time. And I, I, I don't want to cut you off, but if you, uh, we do try to limit the public comment right, period me, a little I'll, bit. So um, I'll, finish, I'll finish that one thing. So as I walk through the neighborhood, because uh, I've been speaking to so many people, they sort of automatically slow down. So uh, I think there's been the thought of maybe putting a picture of me on each of the street corners to slow people down. So I think there are other people out there who want to uh, participate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric? Okay, I'm guessing you can hear me now. Yes, yeah, great. Uh, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to uh, speak with us about this. I really want to thank um, Randy for all the hard work that he's uh, done on this. Please understand that he's not just doing this for him. Um, he's doing it for a lot of us here in the neighborhood. Um, but some other things I did want to mention. Um, I did, I hopefully uh, was able to get some of the pictures out in time. Matt, I'm not sure if you got it. Okay, great. So that has, uh, I, what I did was I marked up some of the pictures to kind of give you an idea as to what the situation was in the neighborhood. And also on that PDF, if you zoom in, you'll see that uh, Randy and I had measured out a bunch of areas of road within the neighborhood. Um, getting to the need for having a speed limit of 15 and under, I think it's uh, very wise to have it uh, set for that. I think myself and others, a lot of us drive maybe 12 miles an hour through the neighborhood, believe it or not. Um, when Randy and I had met with uh, a retired DOT uh, uh, consultant, he said that typically uh, speeds were set due to 85% of the driven speed on the road. Um, I do believe most people drive under the 15 miles an hour, but we do have the occasional uh, out of towner. Uh, for some reason, people coming through our neighborhood uh, via Google Maps or you know whatever it may be, uh, they get redirected through our neighborhood. So occasionally you will see somebody drive through the neighborhood 35, 40 miles an hour. It's ridiculous. It's not a stater. They don't know any better. But I mean, by the time they hit the brakes, they could go past, you know, two and a half yards. And there's some really hidden areas. We have a crest at the top of the hill with an immediate uh, two driveways on both sides. You go up that hill, you can't see past your, uh, the hood of your car too well. So you wouldn't even be able to get on your brake before you could pass one of those, uh, either of those two driveways. Um, we witnessed uh, quite a few near misses here. Uh, we are at, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't say, to Rocky Hill Road. Um, so we're at the corner of where Wood and Rocky Hill are. And I, I can remember sometimes yelling at uh, kids coming, saying there's a car coming and telling the car there's kids coming. Um, just last week, as a matter of fact, at that same corner when I was turning left into my driveway, I kind of chuckled because I saw some kids coming. Uh, but I just decided I'm just going to stop and wait. Sure enough, it was a gang of like um, five kids. Three of them stopped and waited, but two just boom, right out in front of me. I chuckled because I saw it was coming, but somebody not from this neighborhood would have flattened them. So um, with that, I'm going to yield my time to others. Thank you again. Thank you. The Mitchells. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hillary Mitchell, and I live at 6 Rocky Hill Road, right next door to Eric. Um, I wanted to voice my husband and I's support for lowering the speed limit um, and just reiterate a few of the points included in Mr. Blake's presentation. Um, our child was the child who hit the car while riding her bike on Wood and Rocky Hill Road. Um, we acknowledge that as a new bike rider, she lost control and was going too fast. Um, but fortunately, the driver of that car knew the neighborhood very well, even though they did not live in the neighborhood. Um, so they knew that the line of sight was obstructed on Wood and Rocky Hill, and they were going slowly. Had they not known and been driving the 25 mile per hour speed limit permitted, the result would have been very different. 
Um, the reality of this pandemic is that there's been a significant uptick in the number of drivers who are unfamiliar with our neighborhood between extra grocery deliveries, restaurant deliveries, and let's be honest, those Amazon deliveries, um, there's a lot more trucks, UPS and FedEx included. Um, you know, and I think we, we reference a number of kids who are under the age of 12, but the other consideration is that there's just as equal number of college students who are home for the semester and new teenage drivers. So while the drivers in our, the new drivers in our neighborhood and college students know to be hyper uh, vigilant, um, their friends do not. And so as a result, there's younger speeders who are also driving in our neighborhood. Um, and these unfamiliar drivers see the speed limit of 25. They think they're able to drive fast when the reality is, is, as Eric mentioned, when you're going 12 miles per hour, it seems a little fast in our area because of the, na the narrow nature of the roads. Um, and I just don't want to see a child have to be seriously injured for us to move forward with making this change um, and respectfully ask the town council to vote in favor of lowering the speed limit to 15. So thank you all for your consideration. Thank you. All right. Um, seeing no further public comment, I just have a question, Matt. Is this something that the council needs to act upon, or can we just make a put it in your hands, um, authorize you to to act? What what specifically would the council action be? I, I think the the action would be to allow us to uh, yeah put it in my and, uh, and Chief Fenton's hands on this, especially as it's an advisory and we can put the narrow street sign up. Uh, that That's a nice development to be quite frank. And uh, I know Chief Fenton and I have had, as you may have gathered, a uh, number of discussions with Mr. Blake and uh, he's done yeoman's work on this. Uh, really, he's made uh, the work on this easy for us as far as staff, as staff goes, uh, finding that as a solution. And I think it seems to be a solution that works for all because you're not officially setting the rate at something less than that, but it's an advisory speed with a narrow sign. So if you wanted to, uh, at this point, I think if the council said, uh, gave the manager direction to go ahead and do that, then I think we can we can have this taken care of. We've already spoken with uh, Jay Reynolds, our public works director, uh, about the availability to get signs uh, crafted. So it seems like a good solution. And uh, I would agree uh, that that is, that neighborhood is, is unique in comparison to others that may have been set out uh, in later years uh, that were more along the lines with modern road standards or, uh, or quite frankly, road standards uh, because there are so many tight streets in there. So I think that would work as far as for us as, uh, on the staff side. Thanks. Um, Chris? Yeah, uh, so uh, Matt, you, uh, you, you, almost hit exactly uh, the, the question that I was going to have, but um, uh, not fully. So uh, <laughs> you, you got this close. Uh, so uh, we've obviously in the past had a number of different people come in and petition and say, you know, I want the, the speed lowered on our road. And for each of them, my recollection has been, it's been sorry, no. Um, so this one, obviously now it's, it's different. And I totally get the, what, the rationale we've heard. Uh, that rationale, however, applies to a number of other roads in town as well, I assume. So what I'm curious uh, uh, to know is, um, have we done any type of analysis where we've said this is the worst spot in town, or is this just one of uh, many spots that are in a, of a similar ilk? And if so, are we prepared to offer the exact same deal, the exact same offer, the exact same uh, outcome to every other uh, section of town that comes in and says, hey, we're just like them. We also want our 15 mile an hour sign. If, if I may, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question, Councilor Strawn. Thank you, thank you for that. And I'll try to get closer to the mark uh, with, my, with my answer. Uh, the, the qualifying standard is the 18 feet or less, which is, is consistent in that neighborhood. Whereas if, uh, you know, if I lived in, uh, let's say if I, was, if I lived in Broad Cove where the streets are much more uh, along the modern standards that wouldn't be applicable there in the 25 miles an hour, uh, you know, we would, to do that, then then we'd be looking at the town taking over or in or inhabiting that space, which is not where uh, really where we want to be as far as accepting that liability. But with the advisory option, with the qualifying standard of it being under 18 feet uh, consistently, there are 
there are a few locations within town and uh, we'd be obviously, uh, we're happy to work with uh, Mr. Blake in the neighborhood. Uh, we'd be happy to work with others who had a similar request and had sim similar circumstances. Um, Matt, it was brought to my attention today that perhaps a more proactive process might be helpful um, rather than waiting for those neighborhoods to come to you if there was a way to review eligible neighborhoods. It, it, we could definitely do that. We could definitely do that. And as far as look, I mean, there are, as your former assessor, I could probably name them on, uh, name them off pretty quick uh, from <laughs> trying to canvas neighborhoods uh, when I was having to visit properties as well. And I, you know, everything that Mr. Blake had said, and uh, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Johansson and, uh, and Mrs. Mitchell, uh, you know, driving in, and we all know it. I mean, you get into those neighborhoods, especially if you encounter a UPS truck in some of those, in some of the older, really older neighborhoods, uh, it's a negotiated settlement uh, to get to get by. <laughs> but, I, but I think we'd, we'd be happy to do that as well, um, uh, for sure. Oh, Madam Chair, you're on, you're on mute still, sorry. Yes, I just got my little screen <laughs> alert also. Um, I, I was saying, what do other counselors think about authorizing um, the manager to, um, to in, engage in a proactive process to identify eligible roads as narrow roads and proceed with the narrow roads designation, Chris? It uh, sounds good to me, but it looks like Chief Fenton has his hand up. I'd like to hear what he has to. Ah, okay, I didn't see that. Thank you. Sorry, Chief. That's all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that this, even this designation is being done by the DOT, so it's not us independently going at it um, and speaking with a DOT member. And, and I truly trust Mr. Blake, but just to confirm all that he was sending us, I did have a long conversation with DOT. And uh, this is a very unique designation of something I wasn't aware of, the former chief wasn't aware of, something I've never experienced in my career. Uh, but the DOT does set all the speed limits and they can also uh, designate, he was able to do it uh, via his computer, looking at the, the configuration of the road and say that this does fall under that narrow roads guideline. And uh, it's a very specific thing, but once again, it is set by them that we simply enforce, they set, so. Madam Chair, if I could also provide, uh, I know the, the, the next question that may enter the council's mind is uh, the town has a traffic calming policy and uh, we have followed that as well. Uh, initially, uh, the actions that we took uh, were, uh, were threefold. Actually, we've put a, a, a couple of stop signs in locations that were fairly tricky uh, and I think that's been helpful. And then uh, we also uh, provided the neighborhood with some green cones uh, to help uh, raise awareness for reducing speed. And then thirdly, uh, did send uh, a mass mailing to uh, the residents in the neighborhood uh, as part of the policy to state, you know, please, you know, in light of the current challenges of the pandemic, more people are home, more kids are on the street, as well as if you are a pedestrian, you need to also be aware of, of safety items as well. So, and uh, so we have followed those protocols uh, as well as prescribed by the uh, traffic calming policy. So I think this has been kind of the graduation day to get to this point. Um, so it sounds like really you're just looking for our blessing. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and so we don't need a, a motion. Um, so uh, do we have sort it, of... It looks, it looks like if there's consensus, then I think Chief and I are both here and we'll reach out to the DOT to advise them that uh, Council's uh, comfortable with that approach. All right. I see a, a couple thumbs up. Um, Caitlin and... Penny and Jeremy, are you also in the thumbs up camp? Yes. All right. I would say you have our blessing to proceed. Um, and thank you to um, Randy for all of his work putting that together. That did not look like an easy project. So that's some citizen engagement there. Um, okay. So next item. Item 130-2020, consider issuing a request for proposals for legal services. Um, any public comment on this item? 
seeing none. Um, so one of the goals of the town council. You have one. To, what's that? You have one hand up. Oh, thank you, Chris, for having an eye on that. Uh, I think it's uh, Randy. Sorry, I, uh, I, I'm i late, but I'm trying to get it up. I'm not very confident with this stuff, but uh, uh, Matt is correct that the, the, the town and the police chief have been very proactive. We requested a stop sign at Ivy and Wood, and that was there within two days. Uh, so they've been terrific. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say, uh, and it doesn't pertain to this issue, but I think giving the uh, award to uh, um, I just lost it to uh, Bob Malley uh, was well deserved. He's done an outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for your help. Happy we could help out, but it really didn't take that much effort on our part. So thank you for doing the heavy lifting. Um, okay, uh, so seeing no other comments on this next item, um, one of the goals of the council is to bid contracted services to determine competitiveness of rates. Um, so there is a proposal to um, put out to bid the uh, legal services to determine the competitiveness of rates. The proposed um, or the draft motion is that the council authorize issuance of a request for proposals for legal services for the town, which is in line with the council goals to bid contract services to determine competitiveness of rates. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Valerie. And it looks like Jeremy, is that a second? Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, could I have the roll call up, Jeremy? I, I have a question. Sorry. Oh, and Jamie. Um, just as a, a point of curiosity, um, so we'll be issuing an RFP. Um, what's the review process, or what's the RFP development process and RFP review process going to be for this? Matt, would you like Take to? Take Chair. Uh, yeah, similar to other services that are be uh, provided uh, to the town, we would uh, uh, I would go out and craft an RFP on multiple managers. Uh, I'm I'm making a leap of faith here, but I believe uh, this is a fairly common uh, occurrence uh, with multiple towns. So I'll reach out to my network of other managers to to get an RFP uh, drafted and uh, and get that out there. And then what I would do is. Uh, Set that out the normal RFP process that we have uh, that we've done for other services in town. I receive those uh, recommend or those responses back, and then provide them to the council uh, with an itemization. And then uh, at that point, we bring it to the council to to make that determination as to how you'd want to go. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Did you have another? Did you have a follow up, Jeremy? Uh, no, I just wanted to understand what the process would be. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jamie, go ahead. I just wanted to clarify, and I don't know if we need to narrow the scope of the item here. Are, are we talking about our um, our retained sort of standard legal services council? I know we obviously we're all well aware of the specialty council we have for the paper streets issue. We have bond council, et cetera. I mean, there's there's I think we there's different attorneys that we work with for issues of employment. Um, matters and things like that. So I, I just didn't know if we needed to add any specificity to this item. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I imagine, Matt, did you? Yeah, that, that was my interpretation based uh, on the council discussion at the time was our, 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 general, uh, our general municipal attorney work versus the specialized because uh, yeah, as you, as you state quite uh, clearly and accurately, Councilor Garvin is, you know, the work that we have with, um, with Attorney Parkinson, we've, uh, you know, we have that and uh, that's kind of a specialty area, but this would be more of our, uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, normal uh, municipal attorney work that is provided currently by Monaghan Leahy. 
Okay, just so as long as that's clear for everybody, I, I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, did you want to make an amendment to the motion, Jamie, or do you, are you comfortable with it as is? Um, I, I think just as long, like I said, as, as long as everybody's clear, um, then that's fine, and the discussion reflects that. So, okay. Um, any other discussion on this item, Matt? I'm sure if I, if I may, just to, to help the council as well, I did reach out to uh, uh, Mike Hill, who does a lot of work for us with Monahan Leahy, and let him know that the council was going to be discussing this as part of their goals. And it's not uh, an expression of dissatisfaction uh, with the services that we have received, but more along the lines of uh, exactly as the, uh, as the order is and to, to, to determine competitiveness of rates. Uh, so I just wanted them to understand that we're, you know, it's not because we're not happy with what the work that they do for us, but it's that's a regular, regularly routine uh, um, process that towns undertake on occasion. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're ready for the roll call. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor Deborah. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Caitlin. Oh. Yeah. I, I, last I heard was Garvin. My computer oh, sorry. froze. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Penny Jordan. Yes. Councilor Straw. Yes. Chair Adams. Yes. Thank you. The motion is carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Item number 131-2020, request to revisit zoning regulations related to child care facilities and similar businesses. Um, I'll have opportunity for public comment on this. Again, please do try to limit your comments to about three minutes per person and identify yourself by name and address or affiliation if relevant. Seeing no one. The council did receive an email raising an issue regarding the regulation of child care facilities. Um, there have also been emails that we've received about the, the site plan review process for other small businesses. So um, the proposed action would be to determine if the regulation of this and similar businesses that are currently subject to site plan review should be refer referred to the ordinance committee for review and recommendation. Um, we don't have a draft motion, um, but that that would be the, the proposed direction we had in. Um, Penny, you had requested that this item be on the agenda. Did you have any comment that you wanted to bring up this evening? Yeah, I, I think basically where I came down is, um, uh and, and since reviewing this it do we want to take a look at how uh site plan is applied to uh small businesses versus larger or more complex like developments and things like that um and is there a way to clarify for people because i know that maureen does a really good job um, having sat with her for uh, site plan review preparation of that here are the elements that need to be addressed and um, here helps you figure out to what degree they need to be addressed. So I just wonder if there's a, a step back here that says do uh, daycares and other entities um, have some other uh, um, modified site plan re requirements versus developments. It's kind of where I came down. Were you envisioning a referral to the ordinance committee? Yes. Um, are you making a motion? Um, I would make a motion that we uh, refer to the ordinance committee a um, a review of uh, site plan review process and uh, for the council to assess uh, whether there are 
uh, different modifications that can be done relative to business size and impact. Because I think it has to do with level of impact as well. I, so, sorry, it's not a succinct motion, but. I'll second it though. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, any further discussion on the item? So um, I had asked that the, the small businesses or similar businesses be added on um, because we had some emails from a small business owner about the site plan review process. I'm sure that you all saw that. Mm -hmm. um, just as sort of a check-in from the ordinance committee about the site plan review process and mm -hmm. uh, whether it can be whether it can be pared down at all because we do have the the comprehensive plan which pretty strongly expresses the desire for a vibrant downtown and we want to make the downtown friendly to small businesses and not have too onerous a process while also balancing the needs to have you know things be you know the way that we want them to somewhat regulated in that area so um that's kind of what i was hoping the committee would look at as well uh jeremy um yeah i think i think this makes sense and you know i think what i would one of the things that i would um think it would be really useful to to get a, a good understanding from the planning board in particular is you know to what extent is the information that they're garnering from a site plan for, you know, for a, a small business like this, to what extent is it useful in helping guide their decisions? Um, and I think where, where that information, where the information is, is useful in helping them come to a, you know, a, a decision that, that makes sense for the business and for the interests of the town, I think that's all well and good, but um, I suspect that, um, you know, very often for for very small home-based businesses, there's not going to be a lot of exterior modifications or, or roadway reconfiguration. Um, so that I think you know, this makes sense sending this for a review. Okay, uh, if there's no further discussion, could we have a roll call please, Matt? Certainly, Madam Chair. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously, Chair Adams. Thank you. Uh, the next item is review of the town fee schedule. Um, any public comment on this item? The floor is now open. Seeing none. Um, another of the goals of the town council is to review the town fee schedule um, to implement routine routine review of town fee schedules. Um, so this item proposes discussing the fee schedule and determining the timetable of an annual review. Um, it was my thought that this might be an appropriate item for an upcoming workshop. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Um, so maybe we just put this on an upcoming workshop and take care of that. That one's easy. Um, okay. Item 133-2020, acceptance of a grant for enforcing underage drinking laws, Derigo Safety LLC. Is there anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one, uh, the draft motion uh, is that the cable is with council accept and appropriate a $1,000 award from the Enforcing Underage Drinking Laws grant, which is made and overseen by Derigo Safety LLC. The grant period is September 8th, 2020 to June 20th, 2021. Um, do I have a motion as such? So moved. Thank you, Valerie. Is there a second? Sure. Penny, uh, any discussion on this item? 
seeing none. Uh, Valerie, yes. I would just like to ask uh, um, Chief Fenton, since he's still here, this is um, for enforcing underage drinking. Will, will this go into, um, uh, I saw it as overtime, it's going to pay overtime. Is this for, for uh, regular work or is it something that you're going to be doing separately? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, good. Um, yeah, these, these type of details can come out in two different ways. Uh, some of them are that we, do, we have officers come out in four hour blocks and they can do uh, patrol, extra patrol, it's additional patrol, looking for the areas where kids team, seem to congregate. Uh, that is one type of uh, detail that can be filled. And we can also, sometimes we combine with South Portland and we will combine and do a, um, go to the liquor sales establishments and that's a setup um, program where we send in and ensure that people are adhering to the uh, age recommendations for procuring alcohol. Thank you. Um, any other discussion or questions for Chief Fenton? All right, could we have the roll call, please? Certainly, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. Motion carries unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, item 134-2020, approval of the transfer of forfeiture assets. Anyone from the public wishing to comment? Seeing no one. Uh, the State of Maine Office of the Attorney General has notified Chief Paul Fenton that a forfeitable item may be transferred to the town of Cape Elizabeth if approved by the municipal officers. So the draft motion is the Cape Elizabeth Town Council grants approval pursuant to 15 MRS section 5824 sub 3 and 5826 sub 6 to transfer forfeited assets in the case State of Maine versus Kenneth Jules Laflamme defendant and a $2,000 US currency defendant in REM. Uh, is there a motion as such? Does anyone care to make that motion? I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, I'll do is there it. a second? I'll second. <laughs> Valerie, any discussion? Chris. I'm curious what you have to say about this. What my discussion point would be? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't have much to say about it in this capacity. Uh, fair, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, <laughs> So I guess I'll leave it at this then. Uh, my question would be, uh, is this an instance where there's been an actual criminal conviction? The answer to your question is yes, Councilor Straw. Ah, okay, that, that, uh, that alleviates my concern then, um, as opposed to a situation where it was seized, but there has been no underlying criminal conviction related to it. All right, thank you. Uh, so my understanding with these is that there is actually a court procedure for the forfeiture, and then it's just, on the town to transfer it. So there would be an actual forfeiture count um, in the criminal complaint. Uh, Jamie? I was just gonna ask for the non-attorneys, <laughs> for all of us English majors, <laughs> uh, what what this, I, I don't, I don't, not really clear what we're doing here. So uh, I, I believe what has happened is that this, individual was convicted of an offense likely yeah. in that offense there was some sum of money that was used in connection with the offense there would have been a forfeiture count attached to the complaint so it would have had the actual criminal complaint on there and there would be a forfeiture count there would be a finding whether either the defendant admitted to that count or there was a finding in a court that it was in fact somehow connected to these criminal acts 
And okay. so it's been forfeited and we need to accept it be a transfer from the state at this point. Um, okay. Chris? Uh, in, I, uh, I, I hope I'm not speaking on a turn. Um, in, I think it would be perhaps fair to say that uh, forfeitures uh, are slightly uh, controversial at the national level. Um, there have been allegations that there are instances where people are uh, charged with crimes but not convicted, but uh, in sums of money are then seized in conjunction with that, where then I think the allegations are that the burden of proof is shifted around and it isn't at the same level. And you end up with people who aren't actually convicted of crimes uh, losing large sums of money. Um, it sounds like that doesn't apply here. That this is tied to an actual criminal conviction of some sort. So uh, that alleviate my concern was, and I would never imagine it would happen here. And I assume CAPE it does not fall into the uh, the bucket of in any way. And I totally have utmost respect in uh, 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 for our police department and all the hard work they do. So in no way would imagine it would happen here. But nevertheless, my knee jerk reaction when I see civil forfeiture is whoa, whoa, whoa. So uh, just because of the fact that it is uh, highly, I think it's fair to say it's controversial at the national level. Yeah, and I don't think that our, like we're just accepting it. So whether the forfeiture occurs or not is something that occurs within the court. Um, and there is a procedure for that. And the procedure in Maine is a little bit different than the federal procedure, which bifurcates the criminal case and the forfeiture. So you do see a lot more of those cases where someone might be forfeiting, I feel like I'm giving a criminal law lesson, <laughs> uh, forfeiting money in, in a civil procedure where they do have a more of a burden shift than in the criminal case, uh, but this would be attached to a criminal case. It looks like Chief Fenton has a hand up and Matt is waving at me and Jamie has a hand up. So. Um, yeah. If I can, I'll just clarify the case a little bit. This was a case that was uncovered by patrol officers during their regular duties. Um, it turned out to be a significant investigation that involved the main drug enforcement agency were brought in to assist us with it. Uh, the case was then, with the assistance, of, in a great job by our officers, uh, it was a drug case taking part of, of drugs within the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, there was some seizures done, including of that with some monies. Um, there was a prosecution by the Attorney General's office. Uh, that person was convicted and sentenced to a significant amount of jail time. As a byproduct of that, through no um, process of our own or no knowledge of our own, did we were gonna be receiving any funds. Um, I did suddenly get a letter in the mail that said from the Attorney General's office saying as a byproduct of this investigation, we are seizing some funds and um, we are in line to receive those funds. So that is our involvement. It's not these type of cases that we seek out trying to garner money from anybody. Um, it was actually unknown that we were even gonna be receiving any funds. So these are rare cases that are this big that we deal with, but they do exist. And, uh, you know, it, it's a testament to our officers too. They did a great job with this investigation and it was, you know, close to home. And uh, so if there's any other questions, I can answer those. Um, any other questions for the chief? Okay, any further discussion? All right. Um, so if we could have a roll call, please, Matt. Yes, Madam Chair, I shall. Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Council Penny Jordan. Yes. Councilor Straw. Yes. Chair Adams. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, Item number 135-2020, the formal creation and discussion of the formal creation of a bottle shed committee. Any public comment on this item? Seeing no one. Um, currently two members of the community and a staff person serve on the ad hoc bottle shed committee. The committee reviews options for the allocation of proceeds from bottles and cans collected at the bottle shed. The funds are intended to benefit Cape Elizabeth based nonprofit um, service clubs and organizations that benefit the youth of Cape Elizabeth. Annually applications are accepted from organizations to apply for funding. They must be based in Cape Elizabeth and provide the organization's tax ID number and a W9. 
Um, and so the, the proposed action would be to discuss creating a standing committee, um, which will require an amendment to chapter four boards and committees. The proposed action would be for the council to refer the appointments committee drafting, refer to the appointments committee drafting a charge and composition for a standing bottle shed committee reporting back to the town council for further review and action. Um, do I have such a motion? So moved. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Penny. Uh, any discussion on this item? Yes, Valerie. Um, okay. Uh, my question is, is there a way that we can, since we already have a recycling committee, is there a way that we can just combine this in with oh, our yeah. recycling committee instead of creating a whole nother standing committee? Um, it just seems like it falls right in line with what they're doing and it would just be so much easier. Any thoughts? Amy? Um, not a response to that, but that's a great idea. Um, I just, I wanted to, uh, I was trying to remember our process as it relates to the currently composed committee where the committee makes a recommendation and then the council annu annually approves those distributions of funds. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so it's not the committee that's actually the final decision on the funds. That we, we actually wind up doing that. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. So if we were to review uh, to um, not create a new standing committee, but have the recycling committee take this up, would that be a referral to ordinance then to review the, um, would that require a, a formal change that way? I guess this is a question for, for Matt and or Penny. I think you might be okay just doing it, <laughs> to, to be frank, just saying we'd like to add this to uh, your responsibilities that you know maybe similar to the uh, and other duties as a sign that most of us have to our job descriptions uh, as as a thought uh, to do that that may be the easiest way to do it because uh, uh, that, that'd be my that'd be my guess I could look into it further but I think that would work um, Valerie did you have a question or comment I, I was just thinking is would we just add it to their charge um, for the right. for the recycling committee? We would just change their charge. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, Chris and I can't remember who seconded. Um, uh, Penny seconded, Madam Chair. Penny, it's I saw a lot of nodding and thumbs up. I don't know if you wanted to withdraw the motion in the second and then uh, send this over. Chris? Uh, we'll go that way. I'll withdraw the motion rather than do the, the amendment just because of the roll call stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and do we need a formal motion to add it to their charge or? I, Jamie? I think we do. So outlined in, um, Section eight, um, item three in the recycling committee's uh, responsibility, membership purpose and duties in the ordinance for boards and committees, it lists, it enumerates what their duties are. So I think we probably need to refer to the ordinance committee to update their duties with this additional duty, so. Second. There isn't a catch all that says and other stuff. So I think yeah. I think we should be pretty because this has to do with with deciding on doling out money too. I think I think we should be pretty prescriptive on this. We, so I'd be happy to make a motion to refer this to the ordinance committee uh, to make that update. I'll second. second. You're on mute. Thank you. Phrase of the year. Um, any other uh, discussion on this item? So was it Jeremy who seconded? Uh, uh, I had Councillor Penny Jordan. Penny seconded, okay. Um, all right, so uh, could we have a roll call, please? Councillor Devereaux. Yes. 
Councillor Gabrielson. Yes. Councillor Garvin. Yes. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councillor Penny Jordan. Yes. Councillor Straw. Yes. Chair Adams. Yes. Motion carries unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, item 136-2020, discussion of best practices for 2020 Halloween activities. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing no one, um, the council will discuss and possibly act on recommendations for best practices for 2020 Halloween activities in light of the COVID-19 pandemic concerns. Did you have some um, recommendations for us, Matt? Thank you, Madam Chair. I did, and it's uh, with this evening's uh, with this evening's packet. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we brought together, uh, or with with some regional meetings that have been taking place with other managers. Uh, the item came up that hey, what are all these different towns doing? And then shortly there, and that was probably about three weeks ago, uh, in advance of this. And then shortly after that, I uh, started receiving inquiries from different neighborhood associations and other uh, interested parties to see as to what uh, the town's formal position may be on it. Uh, so what we did was work on uh, coming up with some, with some guidelines that, uh, that came from the CDC. Uh, coincidentally enough, two days after we started the conversation, Dr. Shaw uh, came forward with uh, some conversation regarding Halloween as well with their guidelines. So uh, what I've done is I've tried to pull together uh, uh, guidelines that show from, from high risk to low risk uh, to moderate risk activities that people may use purely, quite frankly, as a guideline, because uh, to try to go out and police, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have reports of uh, of masked uh, trick or treaters going across the Stonegate neighborhood would be darn near impossible to to use our police force for. But felt it might be a, a, a positive step to provide guidelines where people may want to find ways to be more creative to celebrate the holiday as well as socially distance and, uh, and approach it uh, that way. So that's why uh, we've, we've crafted this memo or this, this item to bring forward. Um, the other item that uh, we'd like to have as a town uh, from community services side of it, uh, they pulled together uh, an event on October 30th uh, with all the information available at community services where they've tried to do that uh, with the most sanitary and, and social distance approach to it uh, with, uh, with uh, um, contract contact tracing uh, as well as all the other uh, parameters out to, to try to have a safe event and I think they can accommodate up to about 55 uh, people there uh, they can do it as a drive-through the PDs involved public uh, public works uh, fire and facilities as well uh, to try to provide an alternative to, to families who are looking to have a, a, a safe and, and uh, secure event uh, so we're trying to do that on the night before and the information's there on the on our community services website and that's been fairly well received uh you know where you know with sanitary tables and packages available for for the uh, participants uh but this here also the memo identifies the different approaches you may have noticed last week that the city of portland came forward with their recommendation and that's purely what we're trying to do here is just to to help the public uh i know councillor garvin uh and uh, both councillors Jordan may recall when we had, a, uh, I think three years ago, the massive windstorm that took out pretty much all of uh, the region and it happened uh, on Halloween and or just before Halloween. And uh, the town at that time took an opportunity to, to help people uh, kind of work through that and say, okay, obviously don't do it on Halloween night because the wires may still be down, the lights are off. Um, this, we're gonna go the week later and people appreciated that I felt uh, at the time. And so we're trying to get ahead of it here and just say, okay, these are some good options you may have and to just be in the front of mind. And that's why we brought this forward. It doesn't need obviously a, a council action, but more along the lines of saying, okay, uh, this is a good opportunity for us to reach out to the public and wanted really the council's blessing to say, okay, we're, we're okay with this uh, manager Sturgis and go forward and be safe. Okay. Is there, uh, is there any discussion on this? Um, Jamie? I am not canceling Halloween and exactly. having that be my decision again, Matt. So my kids <laughs> still hold that against me. And 
I am not responsible for that ever again. <laughs> so thank you for these recommendations and I'll leave it at that. You have a lot of company, <laughs> Councillor Garvin. <laughs> um, is it, and anyone else need to abstain from giving that a thumbs up? Um, yeah, we're, we're, for the record, we're not, we're not canceling. We're just saying there may be safer ways to go about doing this. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Best of intentions, not uh, not I'm just ever. washing my hands from the decision. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, all right. Does any everybody else sort of give? Are we? Can we give Matt a thumbs up for that? Yes, nodding thumbs up. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad that my child is not yet old enough to really <laughs> care about that. Although I'm sad that I won't get to dress him up to show him to everyone coming to the door. Um, all right, item 137-2020, Town Council vacancy. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing no one. So I uh, will be stepping down from the council because as of November 5th, I will no longer be a resident of Cape Elizabeth. Um, my term is set to expire December 14th, 2020. Um, the uh, charter, Article 2, um, Town Council Section 2, provides that in the event a vacancy occurs less than six months prior to the next regular municipal election, the vacancy may be filled by a special election for the unexpired portion of the term. Um, but the uh, nominations for the position have already been submitted for the November 3rd, 2020 election. Um, it is in order for the council to declare a vacancy with the position already being filled at the November 3rd, 2020 election. Um, and, and in the absence of the chairman, the finance committee chairperson will assume the duties of the chairman. Um, I am not sure should I recuse myself from declaring the vacancy um, or is it just a general it's it's a ge it's a general uh, a general action more so you, you, since you don't tend to uh, since you don't tend to benefit from this or, or, or do harm I think you're fine uh, taking part in it chairman Adams um, okay and is the specific action just a declaration of vacancy with the position already being filled, do we need to vote on that, or? I think I, I think the, I think the count, formal council action would be to declare a vacancy, uh, uh, and then basically that last that last sentence I think would be uh, would be a sufficient action for the council uh, with their declaration, and then and then you should be able to move forward. Um, is it is it a vote on declaring a vacancy? Yes. Okay. So. Um, and you can make that effective November November 5th as well. All right. Um, so it is in order for the town council to declare a vacancy as of November 5th, 2020, with the position already being filled at the November 3rd, 2020 election. Um, would just this as well be your motion. <laughs> I guess that would be my motion to uh, make that declaration. Is there a second? Thank you, Jamie. Um, any discussion? Jeremy? Um, so I just, I, I just want to clarify, just so I understand um, this really will only impact our November meeting. Um, and does declaring a vacancy, does that change any of the council rules relative to quorum or majority? Or is it just we declare that you know, we made this deck. Yeah. As, as clean as you just stated, Councillor Gabrielson, uh, that you're just declaring that. Uh, you still have to count to, you know, you still have to have a majority and you still have to have quorums and things along those lines. But uh, to, for any motion to pass, you'd have to have a majority vote. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, any other discussion? Matt? Madam Chair, if I may, I just. Uh, as as your manager, I just want to compliment you on the work that you've done in your year as chair. Uh, 
<laughs> you've done a heck of a job. You really should be very proud of the service you provided the town. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed working with you and uh, your efforts have been exemplary in, uh, let's just say, uh, in one of the more challenging uh, tenures of a chair in the history of the town of Cape Elizabeth outside of perhaps 1918. So uh, you've done an exemplary job with a yeoman's work of meeting. So uh, I am grateful for your service. Thank you. I uh, heard that Jamie's first year as chair was fairly challenging as well with the, with the streets <laughs> issue. So I'm in good company. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I have had a blast. And as much as I love Cape Elizabeth, I actually have loved being on the council even more than I loved living in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I'm, I'm very sad to leave the council. So yeah, yeah I will miss these late night meetings somehow. <laughs> Um, but I really liked working with all of you. Okay, so I guess we will adjourn. Quick comment, Valerie. Um, as as uh, presumptive chair pro tem, I, I will extend to you an invite uh, to join us by Zoom uh, at our November <laughs> meeting briefly at the beginning. Um, as you're probably aware, it's customary to uh, send off outgoing counselors um, with the accolades they deserve. And so I hope that you'll join us since uh, we didn't have this evening the opportunity to, to properly thank you for your service and uh, and send you and Chris off together. So if if the evening is free, I hope you'll join us at the beginning of the evening as a welcome guest. I will keep it on my calendar. Thank you. Thanks. All right, the roll call, Matt. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Well, I can't keep her from moving out of Cape Elizabeth. I truly want to vote no, but it's kind of a moot point at this point. So I'll say yes. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. The motion passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, item 138-2020, corporate resolution to open a deposit account at Machias Savings Bank. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing no one. Uh, this is an action to establish a banking relationship with Machias Savings Bank. This is relating to the recent request for proposals for expiring certificates of deposit, certificate of deposits. Um, after receiving five different responses, Machaya Savings Bank was the apparent high bidder with rates provided for six months certificate of deposit at 0.25% and 12 months at 0.35%. Looking for a motion to authorize the opening of a new deposit account at the Machaya Savings Bank and adopt the proposed corporate resolution. So moved. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Thank you, Penny. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, uh, could we have the roll call, please? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. The motion carries unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, on this next item, item 131 or 139-2020, authorization to enter into a lease option agreement with Encore Renewable Energy at the landfill site at the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Facility. Um, I'll first, I'll open the item for any public comment. Seeing none, uh, it's my understanding um, that we may need to table this item. Matt, do you wanna go ahead? Thank you, Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, yes, the, my request this evening is to have the council uh, table this item for action in the future. Uh, we are still working on that lease option uh, agreement with the land. Uh, we're close to the finish line, but unfortunately we could not get it uh, across in time to adequately post it and uh, have it in the council's hands so you could consider it. So uh, we should be able to have it back within two weeks. So we may have a bon uh, bonus time with Chair Adams. Uh, before uh, before she departs the town, but uh, but that would be a, a recommendation if we could uh, 
or at least uh, table it at the moment and then we maybe try to bring it back. Uh, I can advise the council as we get closer. Um, we need a motion to table, is that right? Yes, please. Um, so uh, I'll just make the motion to table um, that item. Is there a second? Thank you, Jeremy. And, and then we just vote on that, is that right? Yes. If we could have a roll call, please. Yep. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. And Chair Adams? Yes. The motion passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, and the last item, item 140-2020, um, executive session request for hardship poverty tax abatement. Anyone from the public wishing to comment on this item? Being no one, do I have a motion to enter into executive session? Uh, might I make a suggestion that uh, normally we have citizen comments on any item not on the agenda at the very end of the meeting. Uh, might we do that before going into executive session? I think that is an excellent suggestion. Um, so anyone in attendance wishing to comment on, uh, I'm sorry, I should ask the council for a consensus to take that item out of order. Mm -hmm. Seeing some nods and thumbs up. Okay. Um, anyone in the public wishing to comment on an item not on this evening's agenda before we enter into executive session and then adjourn? Seeing no one. Okay. Um, so now looking for a, a motion to enter into ex executive session. A reminder that you should please read the full motion. Jamie? Uh, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council enter into executive ses session in conformance with 1 MRS section 4056F to consider a request for an abatement of property taxes based on hardship or poverty. Is there a second? Any? Uh, any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Uh, after we dealt with that motion, I saw a hand go up. Um, I think at this point we do need to move into executive session now that the motion's been made. Um, I think that would, I think that would be correct, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, at this point, if if I would be could be so uh, bold, uh, I noticed that most have left. Uh, 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 the last one we have left is uh, Miss Mitchell, and Miss Mitchell, if you would please, uh, if if you could uh, exit the meeting as the council goes into executive session. Uh, that would be the, the easiest way for them to have their confidential conversation regarding the uh, item on the agenda. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like um, that individual with her hand up has also left the meeting. Yep. So yep. Yep. there's no more comment. Matt, you're still recording. Thank you. Yep, I have my sticky note here, so I had to get to the last box. Thanks, Councilor Gabrielson. And I'm okay. That sounds good. Okay. Um, so we have just exited executive session um, where we considered a request for hardship poverty tax abatement. I am now looking for a motion to approve or deny the uh, request that we reviewed. I'll make the motion that we deny the request for uh, the abatement. Thank you. Is that a second, Valerie? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, and uh, any discussion? Um, roll call, please. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. 
Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. The motion passes seven to zero, Madam Chair. I will follow up uh, on my end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And at 10 o'clock sharp, looking for a motion to adjourn, and we'll have you do a roll call in a, a minute, Matt, and then we'll be done. For sure. So moved. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there a second? Penny, thank you. And uh, Matt? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penny Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chair Adams? Yes. Madam Chairman, you stand adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you all. Take care.